Welcome to the Blackout Show, presented by the Guillen Gray, a show about the Chicago White Sox baseball, the good, the bad, the ugly. We'll debate what's working and what's not on the south side of Chicago. It's old school versus new school baseball. And most importantly, we're keeping all the receipts. up everybody it's gonzo here with me tonight is as always justin lee and ozzy Gian jr and boys we got our friends from the bum cast and it's dougie fresh with baloney guys welcome to the blackout show and guys really quick here i gotta put on or put out here a tweet um from our one and only our friend james fagan guys it's optional baseball <laughs> dougie baloney tell me what you thought when this came out <sighs> My, my, first, go my ahead, first, no, my first thought out of that whole thing was, you know what? It should be anything optional for anybody batting over 200. Are we anything out of that? Nothing's optional. If you're not betting 200, nothing is optional. That's my thoughts. Yeah, I think it was like uh, the reaction everyone had. It's like, yeah, stretching optional. It's been optional for the last four years because... <laughs> None of these guys seem to be stretching and everyone's going down with injuries. And it's like, oh, yeah, now it's on paper. We knew it. We knew it all along. That's sick. It's just <laughs> sick. We literally have the stiffest team in sports. And all of a sudden, they don't have, like, they, you're absolutely right. This should not be optional. You should be doing fucking calisthenics more than batting practice at this point. Mm -hmm. You know what, Gonzo? You know what? I want those guys like Russell Wilson on the plane. I want them stretching. I want them doing shit up and down the aisles of the plane. High knees. Yes, high knees on the plane. Now, can you imagine like we're we're three and fifteen right now, and we have a personality as and self centered, polarizing like Russell Wilson on the roster, bro? <laughs> this would be a fucking shit show. Literally. I'm gonna play. I'm gonna play devil's advocate. So. The only thing that I could see this saving Pedro and his staff is that it might have been the schedule because of the rain. You don't want to go out because it's raining. Um, I know for a fact a lot of their meetings previous years were optional, like optional hitting meetings, optional pitching meetings, um, because they had a lot of veterans on the team. Mm -hmm. Even without this team being 3-15, and 15, you have a lot of young players that are trying to build habits. OK, in the big leagues of building good habits and strong habits. And sometimes those habits are created by guys in the, the team. Like, let's say you have a Paul Konerko who leads by example and everybody is kind of follows a leader. But if you don't have that because there's not anyone that kind of takes that role, then you just follow the team rules. Uh, so that's the concerning part of when you have optional uh, conversations, because here's the part that's funny. Even when guys go out to stretch before batting practice is usually a BS stretch anyways. Mm -hmm. But the fact that even that BS stretch is optional makes it's me think about, well, I'm saying what else is optional because that's like such a small part of like what you have Winning to do. is optional, apparently. Well, here's <laughs> no, the other part. It's not you know, even on the table. <laughs> if their manager, if, if Pedro's whole mindset was more of a Joe Madden, hey, we're here to have fun. Uh, you know, we're not a stressful team. We kind of go just with the vibes. You know, Joe Madding hippie, let's, you know, pet animals type of clubhouse. I'd be all about it because that's his attitude. But here's a guy that tells us every day how he's obsessed. Can't look at a freaking, you know, whenever the uh, moon thing happened. The because eclipse. He was the eclipse because he was focused on baseball. That he's Mr. Hard-Nosed. You're Mr. Hard-Nosed working hard every day. 
we're doing the work, we're doing the work, the process is great, even though we lose, but then stuff's optional. That's where I think it was a bad look. Not the same message that the manager's giving is to what's posted on that uh, kind of like your day-to-day habits. That's the only part that I thought was bad about it, just because every team does everything so different. Yeah, and I guess like because of Pedro Grafol and his time here, he seems to be a player's coach. You know, he he doesn't really hold people accountable. And when they do fail, you know, he'd fall on a sword and his press conferences are, you know, brutal to listen to. But he's never really, you know, putting people to the fire. The problem is you're three and 15 and he talks about them not wanting to press. But maybe you press a little bit. Maybe you hold a couple more meetings. Maybe you don't have batting practice as optional. Maybe everyone takes batting practice because ain't nobody hitting on this team. Right. So like, that's where that's where the dichotomy is like, all right, I get it. You know, like he's he is a player's coach. But, you know, you, you at some point you got to put your foot down, you know, because the three and 15. Like we can't get any worse. So I love the fact that you're bringing that up. And I'm going to snitch on some people here right now, meaning that. Oh, boy. I'm, hold on, I'm not. A, I'm not a beat writer. It's not my job to tell this to the fans, and maybe I'm the guy that's going to tell them. But snitches get snitches, OJ. Sunday, Sunday versus Cincinnati Reds. Mm-hmm. Okay, day game. Usually teams don't hit, but if the team that is about to sweep you is hitting, mm-hmm. you also hit. The White Sox did not hit, and I got out, and I'm getting text messages from people saying the team's not hitting today. And it's and it's like the Reds are hitting, and they they're about to sweep you. So there's like a rule, like and that happens in all of baseball. Like if the team that's not winning the series is the other team's hitting, or like they're the better team, let's say the Yankees in the '90s or the 2000s, like you're yeah. like, oh damn it, we have to hit, especially if you're the home team. So that was before this little optional menu came out, and I'm I'm on the same uh, boat here as uh, as the bums, where I'm concerned about like maybe you need to press a little bit. I'm not talking about hit the full panic mode and like just lose it in a press conference because that's not your style, but right. maybe a little pressing, you know, the little, you know, your job security, you're acting like you're here for the next 25 years. Maybe you want to press a little bit. And, 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 you know, that's one of my issues too, OJ, is baseball is one of the sports that polices itself. The unwritten rules are there for a reason. And when you got instances to where you got the Cincinnati Reds, who's not even in your fucking, con- in your fucking league, the Reds aren't even in your league. They're coming. They're going to whoop your ass at home. And you can't even just be a baseball team for a weekend. Just be a baseball team. Be competitive. At least show some competitive fight, right? Like, that's my issue, is the competitive balance in an athletic sport is gone. And you don't have many chances and opportunities to affect the game in baseball as you do in basketball or football or even hockey as much. So when you do have that opportunity, you have to be ready. The White Sox don't give a fuck about being ready to compete every day. Pedro Grafal looked me in these green fucking eyes and lied to me and said they're going to prepare every day to kick somebody's ass. Well, guess what, Pedro? I'm tired of getting my ass kicked every day. <laughs> you Here's know, for, for me, it makes me question, like, by leaving everything optional, does that mean, like, is everyone kind of segregated in their own groups doing their own yes. stuff together and not gelling as a team? Cause no we team. saw, we saw in the whole like eclipse situation in Cleveland, Pedro wasn't out there and I'm sure others weren't either. So like now we got this whole like culture being questioned as it was as bad as it was, you know, before and I feel like nothing's changing. There's no change to this. So of course we're going to continue with the same path of losing because Nothing has changed has been changed at all. No, that's why, and that's why he's same. so awkward. And that's why he's so awkward is because he he's like an anomaly because he doesn't fit into a mold of a manager. We just had him share right now that he is a player's manager and the fact that he's never thrown anybody under the bus, which yeah. is fine. But then when you have him in situations where you think that you would see him with his players and make sure that his players are always around him, like for example, Ozzy Gian used to have the national anthem. Situations where you need the team, all of, you, all of them looking at you, mm-hmm. he doesn't make it like a mandatory thing. So it's like, I'm not throwing you under the bus, but I'm kind of also letting you do whatever you want. And in the fact that he's more of an old school manager of just letting guys just kind of be themselves and kind of like, I'm going to be so separate in my office. 
and the guys were kind of running their own thing. That's like an old school manager mentality. Uh, and I'll use an example. Ozzy was just managing winter ball. And one of the things that he said he had to make different was the guys that he's managing there are usually between the ages of like 18 to 25 years old, a couple of veteran guys. Okay. So he made it a point and it's like a normal thing to be in the kids faces more because they're not that mature where they can just do their routine. So he's like walking around more in the clubhouse, even as it at his age, because you know, you're like, you can't put yourself in the office. And it's like those little things because this team's also very young. And even if it's always a BS stretch or a BS hanging out, I think having the players in that moment of just everybody being there and you're going to kind of just have a message. Those are the things that you, those are the parts that start telling me that things are not going well without starting to talk about the fact that we're not the best defensive team. And that's other stuff that we can get into yeah. because if we were getting beat because we can't hit, I'm like, that's great. We're still number one defensively. Yeah. We're still number one, but we're not even number one defensively. The White Sox defense is like ranked under 15th. So it's like little lies that are coming up and showing us this horrendous record of three and 15, which I think, I didn't think the White Sox were going to win the division. I did not think they were going to be three and 15. I'm sorry. That was not my take on this to start no. the season. We knew they were going to be bad. We, as the bombs on Monday, we talk about how we, the expectations were low. But even by low standards, this is, I did not expect a worse April than last season. Last season, I thought, was the worst April I could re ever remember. And now right. we're sitting here talking, and it's substantially worse. Like, by all metrics, they're having a worse April this year than last year. And this is, you know, a year into Pedro Grafold's job. And I know that, like, you mentioned, Junior, that, like, they are a young team. I would argue that they have young players. But the average age of this ball club is like 29. There's a lot more journeymen and like veterans, but they haven't really made it everywhere else. So that's where like they don't have an identity. You know, if this was a team full of young guys and, and Pedro Grafold's like, well, now, you know, I got to teach him my way. And like you mentioned, I'm, I'm the hard nosed manager that stays to myself and that I understand. But these guys have been around the block. They've been on multiple teams, some of them with success, a lot of them with middling success. Yeah. So that's where it's like, I feel like Pedro, I, like, I don't want to give him any credit. Or I don't even want to give him any room, but like he <laughs> is between a rock and a hard place because, you know, all these guys are veteran guys. They're just, I mean, we talk about our show. They're a bunch of bums. So, like, so it's like, you can't, you can't teach an, an old dog new tricks, right? Like these guys are, they are who we thought they were. Yeah. yeah. The, the total vibes that I get from this team is like, today's modern school no child left behind you know like these are just these are just like the guys that are just you know ah we couldn't make it here let's give them a shot on the socks you know <laughs> dude it just, like it, so basically basically guaranteed rate is like the island of misfit toys basically yeah yeah alter Gu boys, guaranteed alter, job alter, alter boy misfit toys because there hasn't been and, and i like the fact that he said misfit toys and the fact that they're not young and 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 they're hitting they're hitting spots that when you're looking at a at a roster construction, you really start to think and saying, where are we going with this? Okay. Because other than the pitching, the couple of guys that you're seeing, like the kids that have thrown the last week, they're like, hey, that guy can be here in four years and it's really gonna help you out. But there's guys on this roster that are not superstars, they're not young, but they've been they haven't been able to make it in other teams, even as utility players, right. okay? Uh, teams that need utility players. So it's like, this is like their last, like the last stand for them, like the last spot for them to be able to get there. So you would think that everyone would be on this team and really take it serious and say, hey, you, we really don't have another chance after that. And that's why I thought this team was going to be dangerous because in the sense of like, they're going to be a dangerous 70-win team because I thought their attitude was going to be like, hey, I'm Pedro Griffo. I don't have a job next year. Like if, if you have a, if you have like a baseball mind, you're like, I'm going into the season. Like we're not doing good. I might get fired. Okay. And I'm in, if I'm a position player and I just had to give it a shot, I'll give you an example, like a Nikki Lopez or a the young, uh, any of those guys. I'm like, Hey, if I don't play good this year, it's Mexico for me or Japan or, or home. So I thought that that attitude, they were going to mesh together and they were just going to go out there and like really, really just like be hard nosed and grind it out. But then when you see things as optional, you start saying, okay, 
now it makes the situation a lot worse because you're saying that in your head, you're saying, hey, what else is optional? I'll give you an example. I was talking to Ozzy Senior about this. What happened to the eye pitch? Last year, yeah. they, they, they yeah. went on this big marketing scheme that they looked like they were selling the machine. Okay. <laughs> Today they were talking about the eye pitch. And the mm-hmm. eye pitch is helping Andrew Vaughn. And you know, it's this pitch that the White Sox were so late to buy um than other teams. And that's why they're doing good now because the players finally have this machine. Are they using the machine? It's like my it's like my Peloton. It's not my Peloton's <laughs> fault that I'm overweight. <laughs> I don't the, use it. The, the, yeah, the eye pitch is just like a treadmill. You know, it's just collecting clothes. It's it's collecting, yeah. you know, the old winter coats and, and stuff that doesn't fit me anymore. You, you know, know what, gang? Peloton sucks because I'm fat and I'm overweight. It's because I don't use it. Like, if I probably got on the damn thing and followed the instructions that it said, I, I'm sure that it would work. So that's, that's where we're at right now where it's concerning because the record, even the record, sh- the record should be for a bunch of kids that have never played in the Bailey's before. But mm-hmm. as he just mentioned, they're not that bunch of kids that haven't played. They're all middle of the road guys that should be at least more competitive, which is the part which makes it really interesting of, is this team just going through a really bad positioning or is this team really going to flirt with 40, 45 wins, which is really scary. Man, look, I'm going to tell you right now. See, there's people on this planet that just live for my stress. We got SB75 right here talking about some Pedro is the man for the job. Well, guess what? We got a whole fucking segment for your guy, Pedro Grafal. So you know what, Gonzo, without further ado, this is Grafal's Grounds. You know, I don't have a problem making decisions. I don't have a problem making a call on a... You know, on a on a pitcher, I don't have a problem making a call on, on you know on the, whatever our team needs at this particular moment. All right, gents, he's got no problem making decisions, and let's go into a pitching sequence here, guys, because I hardly saw this, and my mind exploded during this. These guys were watching the game. I think I was watching it pitch by pitch, and they didn't know what I was talking about until they saw it after the fact. And we got into a huge group conversation about this. And let me just throw up the, the sequence here. So, guys at first and second, Andy at the plate. Crochet actually had a 3-1 count, battled back, made a full count. And on a 3-2 pitch, that was number six there. And mind you, the, pit, the catcher and the plate umpire set up inside. So there's no fucking chance how you blow this call on the black of the plate. Um, instead of a – and India was caught looking on this four-seam fastball. Instead of an inning ender 2 nothing game where Crochet only gives up two on 38 pitches, next batter, Steer, doubles it in the gap. Next thing you know, it's a 5 nothing ball game. That 38 pitch count goes to, I believe it was like 55 pitches around there. Um, and when India was caught looking and he was walking the first, the camera went to um, Pedro Garfall in the dugout, and this was Lily Pedro. Like just fucking motionless. Guys, I, so it just absolutely blows me. I mean, from an umpire stand of it, me and OJ have our experience with you know, being he umpire. Takes the call. Here's the thing. T- removing the umpire completely, he kicked the call. Yep. Okay, he might have gone to the to the clubhouse and said, wow, I really I really messed that one up. Human element, you kicked the call. This is where people on Twitter, this week, people on shows that get paid for streaming and doing what, are calling people out like AJ Persinski out, guys that have never been in a, in a dugout or in a clubhouse. Other than the fact that I won a great sperm race, I've been in a dugout, in a hanging out platform way, and also in a working platform way for multiple years on good teams and on really bad teams, okay? Any reaction from that, and I'm not just going to talk about Pedro. I'm going to talk about the pitching coach and anyone that's there. Your reaction, okay, when you have a guy like Crochet, who at this point is the main pitcher, he's your guy, you're two and eleven at that moment, two and twelve. So you're you're salivating a win, okay? And this guy messes up this call that could put you in a big difference in a game. So maybe you don't even argue it, 
because it's still two nothing. When it becomes five nothing, okay, that umpire is getting told every single thing in the book that he doesn't want to hear. Okay, the manager should have been out there arguing, and even it could have been a fake argument when he runs out there and tells the umpire, I don't want to be kicked out, but I'm going to be out here protecting my player so that my bench really believes that I'm doing this. And that happens a lot when a manager goes out and is like, hey, I'm not, I don't want to get kicked out, but I need to argue with you. So that's my main concern. Again, going back to what we just talked about, a guy that protects his player literally has no emotion whatsoever. You're, you're, two, you're two and 12. If you get kicked out, there's not much of a difference because the team hasn't really performed with you under him. So that's where I thought that if I was Crochet, I don't know if anybody on the bench didn't like it, that he didn't stand up for him. But I thought if you are going to argue any in any moment, and I'm not talking about just getting – you don't have to get kicked out. I'm talking about showing emotions. Mm -hmm. That was the right moment there because I felt that if you're a player – and you're in the and you're in the dugout, and you don't hear anything coming out of the dugout or anybody standing up for you. You look and go, "Well, if they're not doing that for a crochet, I'm damn out of luck when they're going to stand up for somebody else." And mm -hmm. that's why I'm concerning and saying, "Okay, not only we're we not winning baseball games, but this team is just lifeless. Where they're just going to let you, you're going to let your buddy get kicked down, you know, while you're both down. It's like a bar fight, you know, three on ten. You know, your your two buddies are going to go get beat up." But yeah. they're still with you. And that's my concern on that whole situation where, you know, Crochet should figure it out and get out get out after a bad call. That's a different story. The umpire messed it up. That's the, My problem is that, that Pedro, who's the leader of that dugout, and nobody in the staff, they all looked like they were deer in the headlights when they put the camera on them. And that's a concerning to me. Hell yeah, yeah bro. And Go that's ahead. where we argue about leading by example, right? Show some fire, you know, even if it's like, even if, like you mentioned, he goes up to the ump and said like, Hey, I just got to argue though for the sake of argument, at least show that you care because if you don't care, why would the other guys care? Well, the rest of the team care. It, it's, it's the blind leading the blind. And like, if he has no emotion, this team has no emotion and granted, you know, like some players, you know, play for the love of the game. Some players play for a paycheck. Some players play for, you know, family. Uh, everyone has different motivations. But when you see your coach, your manager out there fired up, arguing, maybe that fires you up a little, you know. At the end of the day, you are a team. And yeah. the last thing I'll mention about the whole thing is just at least for us, the fans who are watching day in and day out that we care. We're yelling at the TV. Give us a little. I'm not asking for much, just a little bit of passion, a little, you know, cookie crumb. Um, Thanks, a little to, bit of to cinematics show, to show that you give a fuck. And you have to know this fan base, guys. The Chicago White Sox fan base will hate Yoan Moncada for the rest of his life because ever since he got here, he's made it look easy. Okay. And they'll love guys like Aaron Rowan, double play rally killer for the rest of his life because he would die for everything and made everything look dirty, just like they love Ozzy Guillen because they think the White Sox fan base, they like, they they want the players that play for their team and the people that are leading it to really have, like, emotionally be attached to the team. 99.9% .9 of the fan base, there's this whole new fan base that has this, like, you know, this like tree hugging mantra and like we all love each other. That's a whole, that's like the new generation. It's a blue collar. You go out there, you, you, you grind it out. You know, you just hustle a hundred percent and you don't give in and you protect your team. That is the White Sox fan base culture. So again, when he talks about that, he knows this Jersey and he goes, this, what this Jersey means and this stuff, it's like, dude, like watch a, watch the documentary from the nineties White Sox. Or, or read a White Sox history book because the way that you're acting is not doesn't correlate with the fan base. The fan base not only they not only like you now, but now they don't think that you're protecting the their players. They're gonna hate you even more. So after every fucking loss that he is responsible for, he talks about this imaginary frustration that he feels and all of this other. Where's the frustration at? It wasn't when fucking Crochet was getting hosed. I was getting ready to kill Gonzo in the group chat because I thought he was being a Crochet apologist over an umpire, uh, a pitcher not pitching over an umpire's blown call. Come to find out, 
my not only did my my future ace get hosed, but my fucking manager was tight lipped, and now he's lying to the media about what he care and what he don't care about in the sport of baseball. Well, from our perspective right here, the five guys that are on this platform, there's no fucking way you can sit here and say you care about the front of the jersey if there are pride, passion, and tradition. I'm 32 fucking years old. That is what the White Sox have raised me on. Pride, passion, and tradition. It's not in that dugout. It's not in that clubhouse. Cuban, Caillou, Pedro, Caval, uh, Grafal got to go. <laughs> you got to go. I, I mean, just to echo, echo your guys' statements and everything like that, but, you know, if Pedro really is the player's coach or whatever. And I, I'm not really a big player's coach guy. Like I don't, I'm not a real big, like coach being your friend type guy. Uh, I'd rather just have them, everybody hate the coach and, you know, play up to their abilities and everything like that. But if he's trying to be their friend in that moment, like you were saying, your friends are in a fight, go out there and defend your friend. I mean, it's like he wants to be their friend, you know, like taking it easy on him. But then when it comes to him stepping up as the friend, you know, he's like alligator arms at the end of the dinner. You know, like he ain't go, he ain't trying to grab the check. Oh, man. Oh, he's Hell. Cool. I'm going to give you a point. Yeah. You guys can look up greatest managers in White Sox history. And you guys can also look up worst managers in White Sox history. Oh, boy. No, hold on. And you're going to see I some names. No, Rick Renteria's name is up there. Okay, Rick Renteria has some seasons that you're like, I'm like thinking back and I, in my head, I'm like, I never thought that Rick was as bad as his record shows it to be. Mm -hmm. okay? Or Jim Fergosi is another one that comes to mind. Why? Yeah. Because I never had a doubt in my mind that Rick Renteria was backing up his players. Mm -hmm. I knew that Rick was like buddy buddies with them and might let them get away with like a night of being out the night before. But I never doubted that he had control of the clubhouse that his players went out and played for him or that he had to back up the players because he would bench guys, you know, Rick had a fire tip and his yeah. teams. Now that I look back at those numbers, I'm like, man, his teams were not, they were not, but you never felt that like the losses right. didn't, were not as heavy on it. And when you look at his first two years versus Pedro's first two years, the, the stats are very similar, but you feel like the Pedro years are just more draining because you feel like you're like, Hey, When's this guy going to, you know, when's, when's the fire for this guy coming in? And I'm comparing those two because my mindset on Rick Renteria in his first two years is way different than Pedro Sugar Falls in the first two years. Mind yeah. you, Rick had one season in this first two years where this team was just really bad. Pedro had a really good team. They just underperformed. So that part of the fire is my problem with that. And I don't know if, like, the, the staff at this point, this is where I'm getting to this point. There's been this debate, and I want to ask you guys this question. There's, a, there's seven platforms out there that say the manager doesn't matter. We suck. It's not going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I believe something completely different because you have to hone that culture even while losing for the future. And even if it's because he is right now the person that's in leadership and he's affecting other coaches that might want to be vocal and don't do it because the main guy doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. Players might gravitate to that. And that's my problem of saying, yeah, I'm not talking about that any manager is going to come here and make this team 100 winning, you know, make them a winner overnight. But I think it does affect the culture for the future of what you're doing. So that's my question to you guys is, are you guys on the boat of, oh, it doesn't matter. You can leave Pedro and he can lose, he can lose 150 games and it's not going to matter in the future. I'm like, there's no draft picks. There's no tanking. We're drafting where we're drafting. Right. Mm -hmm. So we really need to like really start creating the culture of like where this is going in the future. And the way that he's kind of been talked like the toxicity without really being toxic is really affecting, I think, the future of this team. So I wanted to ask you guys if you guys are on that boat of like, well, it doesn't matter. He can lose 150 games. And well, I, 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 to answer your question, I just want to go first because I, I, I like the question. Everybody, we can agree that the Baltimore Orioles are one of the most talented teams in the league, right? We don't have to go through that. And they were both for like 15 years, but yes. Think about where they were managerially with Buck Show Walter and Brandon Hyde. The rebuild wasn't just drafting Gunnar Henderson, getting Adley Rutschman. You have to put the culture in place beforehand. 
Mm-hmm. If you look at Brandon Hyde and Buck Walter, they're old school guys. Uh, I call them white knuckle guys to where they will fight tooth and nail every game just to get one victory. Fuck the tank and fuck everything. Your development right now with the with the roster is my my job is to put you in position to win ball games, prepare you to use your tools every day to win ball games. Brandon Hyde has had a bigger impact on the Orioles winning than the talent because he put the the system in place to make sure those young guys going through their growing pain can stay competitive. Don't lose that fire. Don't get down on yourself when you're in a in a three for 33 slump with one RBIs, Gunnar Henderson. When you're not getting on base, Adley, you have the tools there. You have a manager that believes in you, a system in place to propel you forward. Pedro Gafal has yet to put a system in place to where, let's just say, the talent doesn't meet up with the guys who we're lining up against that particular day. We're just going to have to get our ass kicked. I remember, y'all remember when uh, Pedro Grafal got hired, he bought lunch for people uh, in February? Well, guess what? Magically went there. Fucking two years in a row, Dougie Fresh. We've been getting our lunch ate because yeah. he's the fucking boss. Yeah. It's, when- it's because he is chicken shit, man. He is chicken shit. And I'm going to just, I'm going to say it just really bluntly. The moment that he lost me as a fan was when he let Tim Anderson bat in the one spot all last year and let Tim Anderson fucking go up there and do absolutely nothing. And he didn't have the balls to move him back down in the lineup and maybe throw a little fire underneath his ass. He has no balls. He's a chicken shit manager. And he always will be, dude. There ain't nothing that is going to ever change about him. So here's the part you're talking about being chicken shit and the part that's really – that's, and Ozzy talked about it on the score today. The hardest thing for Ozzy to ever do managing was, do I bench Adam Dunn, okay? And if Adam hits like 250, that team wins the playoff. But he never yeah. – his, his, his point was, Adam has done it for 12 years in a row. Sure. So I have to, and he was making all this money, but he was like, Adam has done it. And he had like this huge, you know, arsenal And the year after that. He did it. So th- you were dealing with players that have done it. Pedro's dealing with no one that's had success. So when he talks about like these players have a trajectory of having success, I'm like, mm-hmm. what are you talking about? Even Pantera has one year, even the guy, Jake Berger, that Gonzo cries at night, every night he goes to bed. He's had <laughs> one good year. He's Daniel Powell. Yeah. Like, even guys that we've moved, it's like under three years. And 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 before you guys answer Boloya and, and Gonzo the question, um, right on, on Justin's point, no one ever talks about Ozzy Guillen's success with the White Sox. What came before that? Okay. And we're very aware internally that we give a lot of thank you to Mr. Jerry Manuel. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because you don't even have to look at the Orioles. Look at White Sox history, 1997. White flag trade happens. Ron Mm -hmm. Schuler gets rid of Ozzy, gets rid of all the guys that were there that are making money, says we need to refresh this team. That gives it a new look in 1998, brings Paul Mm -hmm. Canerco. They start restructuring the team. New manager under Jerry Manuel. In two years, Jerry Manuel is competing again. They're in the 500s. Okay, they win a division. And then Jerry Manuel is fighting for that first to second place for the next six years. Mind you. Under him, you get the core to play more than one year that by the time that Ozzy comes and takes over the team because they say, hey, Jerry Manuel's gotten us to a point, but there's something missing. Maybe he's not the guy that can bring us to the next level. Ozzy comes in, realizes this core is really good. We need to move a couple pieces. They move them. By the time they were successful, if you look at that roster, every single prospect – was at least in year four through six of their major league career. The only person Ozzy ever dealt with as like a pure rookie was Brian Anderson. But everybody yeah. else was guys that were in the league between the between the years of four through six. And that's where, as fans, I see them on Twitter, everybody wants to jump from like the draft to like the World Series. It's like, hey, guys, you need those four years of baseball to hone your skills at the big league level under a manager like Jerry Manuel, like, you know, uh, Buck Show Walter, like guys to build that culture where that success happens. So winning, it doesn't just happen 
overnight. You really need to look at the big picture. And that's why I think he's such a liability at this point. Yeah. So you, I mean, I love the question and I do think managers make a difference. I know that like people can, you know, like you mentioned on Twitter or everywhere else, like said, like, you know, it's up to the players, but I do think building culture, like you guys mentioned, the problem is culture is, is a waterfall. Culture is from the top down. So when we are stuck in quicksand as an organization and you don't want to hire someone from outside of the organization and you want to, you know, hire Chris Getz, who is part of this same culture and the same problem. Like it, it's, it's just like I mentioned quicksand and you, we mentioned, you know, Ricky Renneria and that was a Ricky guy, but Ricky Renneria, Buck Showalter, Ozzy, everyone has an identity. We know what the, what what is Pedro Grifo? What is he good at? What what like we don't have an answer to any. Of it. I don't think if I ask you guys, what is Pedro Grifo good at besides making us mad and giving you know press conferences that just like make no sense? What is he actually good at baseball wise? He uses the word. He uses the the English. Nothing. No, I'm saying he uses. So this is really funny. Somebody wrote me and said. There's no way that someone that speaks better English, I can understand him less than your father that had limited English because of how confusing the words are that he's bringing there. And 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 you you know what? You, you've hit that. And that happens a lot in politics where you sit there and then you just bash like the prior administration. Like they didn't do this and they didn't do that. But then you never tell them what you're doing that's good. It's just like bashing the old group. But you can never tell them what you did that's good. That's what's happening right now, I feel like, with, with with Pedro of, like, it's all bad in the past. But it's hard to say because I don't think he's a good X, X is a no manager. I really don't. I don't think that he is holding these guys accountable where he is a, 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 one of those managers that's like a, a, a ruler where, like, if you break the rule, you're going to run laps. I don't right. think he's that guy. Um, I think with this stuff that says that's optional, I think it's a guy that – is 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 a it has both masters player and front office whoever he has to answer to to like look good in that point you answer the right question so like if it's if it's chris gets it says are you going to hold these players accountable you say oh yeah i'm going to make these guys run and i'm going to whoop them but then if it's one of the players you're like oh dude don't worry about it like i got this and you're playing like this balance back and forth and and that's not good because you can't do that you need to be like either for the players and everybody hates the front office because you're doing everything opposite. Or everyone's mm-hmm. going to say, and you can win. As long as you're winning, it doesn't matter. But right. that's my concern of, of what's the identity of this team. And they don't have one. Even if the identity is this tree-hugging team where everyone's going to be a perfect altar boy and everyone's going to hug each other and, you know, and but you're going to play better baseball and be good defensively, that's cool. That's awesome. You're not going to be the bad boys. You're not going to be the guys that change the game. Whatever it is that you're going to be, I feel like you you hit the nail on the head. They are lacking an identity, and he's been looking for it now for a year and and some change. Yeah, and you mentioned like he stands up for his players, and in his press conference he says like, you know, they're professional baseball players. We're going to bounce back. The problem, and it's something I I said on our show, he's trying to bounce a bowling ball. These guys have been bad for two and a half seasons now. There is no bounce back. It, it, it's yeah. it, it's a dead cat bounce, like uh, Beeflo from the 108 says. It there is no bounce back when you are just at the bottom. You you know you're you're at the bottom of the floor. So that's where he has to figure it out. And like Dougie mentions, he's afraid of ruffling feathers. He's not yeah. going to move Andrew Benatendi down, even though Ben Benatendi in his tenure with the White Sox hasn't done anything to earn that spot. Worse than Jeff Kepinger, Baloney. I'm about to but, scream. But he won't. He won't move him down. He won't. You know, he'll bench him for a day as like rest, but he's not going to bench him for a prolonged period of time. He won't even. You know, hit him sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. He'll be yeah. right there at the top of the lineup along with Andrew Vaughn and everyone else that's hitting under 200. And it's, you know, we just sit there and watch, but it's tough, man. And and that's the thing, because you get stuck. And what the White Sox are, they're stuck. Every day is on default. And it trickled down to the players to at a certain point. You're so baseball, the number one most important thing in baseball is routine and consistency. And with that note, 
that Fagan tweeted out, that uh, Morowski tweeted out too, that lets me know that the White Sox don't think consistency is mandatory. And he's not getting out from the media either. And that's the part that's dangerous because there's people in the media. This is this is the same city that wanted to get Greg Walker and Ozzy fired when they would be 10 games above 500 and being second to teams that won like 109 games. Like this was the city where Ozzy would not go eat a dinner because we lost to the Cubs. Like this Chicago, Chicago was like a tough place, man. Like where you have like the media, like a place where Joe Madden was broken. Like the guy who was like the king of handling the media and they would ask him the hard question. And I feel like, like Pedro's so good at his magic tricks. Like the media doesn't ask him anything. Like Fagan did not ask him after the game and say, Hey dude, what is this optional stuff that you're writing? Like Joe Colley, a guy that doesn't even cover baseball broke a story on like something with the bulls and wrote a little quote about the like baseball. And that's like the wildest story we've had. So I even think that even from a media standpoint, like everyone's just gotten like weaker of like, okay, well it's okay. Like we suck. Like it's not a big deal. Like, okay, well Pedro's just going through like flush it. And that's the part where you need to like wake up and be like, wait a minute, this can't be the new norm. Like I'm a Real Madrid fan. Today we won in the championship. Yeah, me too. And that's a, the standard of like where you're at. Like, you know, if a coach loses this game, this thing gets you're fired. Like, it doesn't matter who you are. Like, it's a standard. And I feel like there's no standard. Like, we're the Sox fans are, like, le- lowering their standards, like, during this time. Like, it's like, oh, well, it's not a big deal. Like, you're lowering your standards. And at that point, I think even to rebuild to, like, where you were at before, it takes that much longer. And that's really good. Like, right now, everyone – like, right now, Jerry's the default guy. Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. Like, every, uh, Jerry, Jerry's, like, the new president. And it's like, wait a minute. The decisions have been made. Like those people need to react and 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 fix what they're there. They were hired to do that job. So even if Jerry fires the next guy and the mm-hmm. next guy comes and does the same thing, then I'm like, okay, well, you're just hiring the wrong guy. But this is how much that look at the list of managers that were available that Pedro Grifo got picked over. Yeah. Like that that many people in that organization thought that highly of them. So you 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 you're getting a lot of people like like whose hands are in the fire and you need to deliver for these people. You know what's sick? The United States of America were leading me to believe that the Oakland Athletics were going to be worse than the Chicago White well, Sox. Well, they were because Mark Katze is the manager of that team. Mark, Mark Katze. Katze. Mark I wake up every day wishing Mark Katze managed my Chicago White Sox. Nope. Every and day. And, and White Sox Twitter thinks that there's more talent on, uh, on the Athletics because they watch the movie Moneyball Two years ago, <laughs> and, and they think that that's the same way that they draft and that the pitching staff is – no, no, no. That team – talk about not spending money. They they got zero free agents last year. They didn't get Tommy Pham. They didn't get Clevenger. They didn't get nobody. No okay. Fetty. They didn't get they didn't get Fetty. That team is working with nothing, mind you, into a division, okay, where they have better teams than the Central, t- mm-hmm. theoretically. Only the World Series winner and the World (laughs) Series winner before that. But Mark Katze, I know who Mark Katze is. Yeah. But what you're just talking about, I I know his identity. I'm not going to come in and not know who Mark Katze is. I know who Nick Swisher is if he was giving a team to manage. I know who A.J. Brzezinski is, Jermaine Dye. I know guys that have character and say the good and the bad, just like Azekian, the good and the bad. I know what they stand up for and what they bring to the table. With Pedro, I don't think that that has been established. And it's getting to the point where it's kind of like filtering to other coaches of like Ethan Katz. Like, yeah, he's a smart dude, but like Cooper was a smart dude. Like what else do you bring to the table? Like the, we can't do it for the hitting coach because he's been kind of, uh, you know, been around for a while. But again, the things that bother me, and, and I'm, I'm going to be completely honest, I usually don't get bothered where I like throw stuff unless there's some wagering going on in the game or my fantasy team is affected. So since we're on Griffol's ground, I'm going to call out two plays. Because oh, they, shit. Well, Cleveland, where Kopech had just pitched two innings and they had the day off, mm-hmm. he didn't bring him in because Kopech wasn't available. Okay? Why isn't Michael Kopech available? No one ever answered him, knows that. Cost me the saves, basically lost that week. <laughs> it was a bad week, but I'm going to blame it on him. And then today, I told you guys he was going to win one game, okay? But it was flip flop. 
<laughs> the worst part was, and this is where I'm really pissed off, he claims that he's Salvador Perez's daddy. When he came to Chicago, we sent Salvador a text message and said, oh, we didn't know your mom got remarried. He was like, what do you mean? So well, Pedro Grafolzi, you're saying that he's like your dad. Like he's basically like raising you. What are you talking about? He was just my coach. And so he claimed like, oh, Salvador Perez is like my son. Okay, pretty much. Yep. So if you know that he's your favorite player and the greatest player that ever lived that you ever managed, I would hope that you would know his scouting report. Okay, You would think so. You would think so. You got first base open and you got a Venezuelan. And Don Cooper always said, don't ever throw a first pitch fastball to anyone who has a Latino last name. <laughs> And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this because we talked about this on the pre-show and I had the quote ready because it drove me crazy. So Pedro Grafol's quote after the game today was Pedro Grafol on not pinch hitting for Maldonado in the seventh with Dijon. Or So first, first of all, he was, he's standing up for Maldonado for not pinch hitting to him. And he says, no, we're up at the time. I'm not doing that. I'm keeping my catcher in there. He puts the right fingers down. He knows what he's doing, and I'm not doing that. Maldonado is the one throw, po pointing the fastball. So I understand if you win the game and you're defending him, but you gave up the go-ahead run because you threw a fastball to Salvi Perez where everyone knows, like, you know, and it granted, like, Michael Kopech throws what? Like, almost 90% fastball. So it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, he's going to throw it. Well, but, it. But the fact that, like, you have first base open and you know – like everyone knew it was coming, and it's like I, I talked about like Mike, me listening to the game. You knew something was gonna happen, and the fact that Salvi Perez just hits one out of the park because he's a professional ass baseball player, and Pedro Grafol is not a professional manager. That's the difference. The slider has mm -hmm. been looking better though, so I, I, I just he don't is, understand. He is throwing more slider, yeah. Gonzo, just know. open up with the slider though. Here's the thing: Michael Kopech has a control problem. Okay. Yeah. So why are you gonna ask him to pitch around? Oh, no. Well, Oz, Ozzy said. Well, Ozzy goes. I wouldn't have put the go ahead run at first base. And I said, I'm sorry, but if my guy, first of all, somebody should have gone to the mound and talked to him and said, Hey, mm -hmm. you got Salvi coming up, kind of like Major League Baseball. Who do you want to face? You want to face Salvi or you want to face the other guy? Okay. No well, one ever went up to talk to him on that. So Maldonado's calling the game then. Okay. So is Maldonado following a scouting report? Because if you're going, this is a part where I think it's funny. Maldonado so is managing the team. Hold on. <laughs> I thought the White Sox were supposed to be an analytical team. I thought we were supposed to get horizontal vertical and we were going to go on matchups because that's why Kopech is there in the eighth and not the ninth because we're an analytical team and we're going matchups. So why are you pitching to whoever was behind Salvador and, not, and Salvador Perez? He's the only guy on that team that has credentials to be like, okay, like so pitch to the other guy and again you guys you're gonna give up your pitchers are gonna give up bombs but that one looks so bad kelvin escobar on my twitter replied to it like it was like <laughs> because it wasn't even like it wasn't even like oh i'm gonna try to like the miss it was like here you go it was a challenge and that's fine but the fact that you're getting too cute that's okay when you have credentials like a joe madden like tony la Russa. The only mm -hmm. reason that the only reason that Tony Russo got away with saying all the stuff that he said with the pinch runner and the walking the guy with two strikes and nobody went crazy on him, it's because it was Tony. Any mm -hmm. other man in the world does that, and they're like, you get fired on the spot. Like you're an idiot, get off, like you're fired. But Tony has the credentials. Pedro Grafo, I don't know where he gets that he has the credentials to to like play these mind games. You don't. And you're trying to win the game. Big dog. I mean, maybe to your point, Ozzy, you know, uh, you you know, Pedro's his daddy. You want nothing better than your kids to look good, right? In, <laughs> in life, you know, you want your kids to look good. Maybe he just was like, you know what? Let me serve this up for him. We're going nowhere, you know. Let's let let's let the little guy feel good for a moment. And the box looked way worse in the pitch. In the pitch, I thought it was more up and in. On the box, it was oh. like <laughs> right. No, it was th it was thigh high. It was, it was a meatball. meatball, dude. Yeah. It, it was served up, and then Kopech looked like he was upset that the ball got hit out. Well, here's the a part. Well, here's the part. Well, here's the part where I get where uh, I where I want to get my info, and I haven't talked to Kopech. My guy sees out there because I would have been writing him right away. When a pitcher <laughs> has a reaction like that, there's a couple of things that can that can they can be reacting like that. Number one is I did not want to throw that pitch, right? But I have to listen to the catcher. 
Right. Or I wanted to throw that pitch. It didn't land there. So I want to find out which of those two mentalities he was worried about. That would be more my guess is that he he didn't land his spot correctly. Because if he doesn't, let's put it this way. If he's pissed that he wanted him to throw a fastball and that's his best pitch, if he doesn't have confidence in his own pitch, that's why his ass is in the fucking bullpen now. Because, you know, maybe he doesn't have confidence in himself. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it right now. How many sliders do you think Kopech gets over against Salvi? Two outs, tie game in that spot. How many sliders in a sequence? Let's just say a seven-pitch sequence. How many sliders do we get over? Two. Yeah. Yeah. The same amount of analytic guys in their department. Too. <laughs> well, here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. I hope that if he's being a good manager and he's there for the future, and this is where managers matter, I hope that somebody after the game, and I'm not talking about talking in the media, I yeah. hope yeah. Maldonado and I hope Pedro went to Michael after he cooled down and said, hey, we know you challenged him. That's good. I don't want you to be – I don't want you to not have balls. I'm going to say right. it. Your best pitch is a fastball. Maybe you miss, don't miss there, miss low and away, miss, miss middle up. Mm-hmm. And the next time they're in the bullpen, you go through that sequence again. Say, hey, if you're in that situation again, what would you do different? Oh, you know, I, I maybe I go forced, I go, yeah. I go in that. But again, because again, this is where people talk about coaching. That's what I hope Pedro is doing with the staff. Because even if you fail, I hope that conversation is happening and you're not treating it like, oh, yes, this is Mariano Rivera. He'll get over it himself. He, Michael Kopech needs that coaching and that honing in that moment for him to be better and be greater and be part of the White Sox or part of a trade later down the road of his career. That's what coaching is. Like, okay, we this was the move. We lost. But you got to make sure that your guy is ready to go the next day and yeah. be like, hey, do you know what you did wrong? Uh, not really. Well, you, you good pitch. You just threw a middle in. How can that's, you, a, what, that's what, a good at. That's a yeah. good ass point, OJ. Because consider it like for a right-handed power hitter, it's easier to get to velocity lower in the zone because you'll just drop you'll just drop the barrel. But it, let's just say if Michael would have missed up and in, Salvi probably at the worst would have fouled it back, or his bat and his wrist would have been sawed in half. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's just a conversation. To your point, OJ is just if I'm if we all know you're gonna put the one down. You just gotta know where you can where you where you can get away with. Because if you yeah. want if you want to just open up a little bit, that hundred ninety eight to hundred mile per hour would have been right on his fist. You still would have missed your spots, but it's the game would have still been within reach. You know yeah. those are the lessons learned. And the pitch was at ninety seven, uh, but but yeah, like you take that any day. But like you said, you learn where to miss. And that's where, I mean, we've given Griffo a lot of gruff, rightfully so. But that's where, you know, the new guy, Bannister and Ethan Katz, the pitching coach, we we were all super high on Ethan Katz, you know. And I made this joke somewhere else, but like he's aged like a pre- like the presidency. Like he like he like if you see him at his introductory press conference, what now four years ago or three and a half years ago to now yes. it's like obama before and after the presidency he's great <laughs> he's got gray in his beard like ethan katz has gone through some shit because he was the golden boy and and we had you know at the time we thought we had a future with this team and it slowly just crumbled way, all around him swing, because people swing the bat in a real game and in the lab nobody swings the damn bat in the lab the ball just rotates yeah and just spins and it looks pretty and it's on Instagram and it's got the rap Soto and the velocity. And there's not a dude named Pedro trying to take you deep or a guy like Bobby Witt, you know, just waiting for you to make a mistake. One of the Venezuelans. One, no, but I'm saying the level, the, the part of the competition, I wish that there was a camera just in the dugout. And that's why when I watch the games at home, it's not the same that when I'm at the stadium, because I love to see, the interaction of what's happening in a dug in a clubhouse in a dugout. Yeah. Like when there's a mistake made, like who goes up to the player and say, Hey man, do you know that you just made this mistake? So, and and people think it's always the coaches. Sometimes it's the players, like the real successful pitching staffs that I've seen the pitchers themselves say, Hey man, why'd you throw balloon? Why, 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 why'd you throw that pitch? Ah, you know, I was thinking that, no man, your slider's better. And that, that camaraderie and that, that teaching ability, starts becoming a thing and you kind of learn together as you progress through the big leagues. 
is my my concern is because I'm not there is are they having those conversations of runner on second and you're swinging for the fence and then you're like, hey man, why did you try to move the runner? Are the coaches doing that or are they just sitting there and going through reports and not having that human element? That's my concern because I hope that after the game or or even tomorrow because they might want Michael to cool off, they go through that peach sequence and and make sure that the next time that he's up against Salvador Perez or anybody that's in that situation, hey, we're gonna we're gonna try to do it better. Yeah. I have such little hope in Pedro because of the way that he does stuff that I'm like, I don't think he's doing that. When a year ago, I never even crossed my mind. I'm like, oh yeah, Pedro will definitely be that coach and be with talking to guys. Now I'm like, I don't even know if this guy's talking to his players about what's going on day to day. I really don't. So here's another question I'll have for you guys because we we do talk about identity and you just talked about players policing themselves and we talked about this this last previous Monday. Who are the leaders on this team? Who is the person that's going to go up there and talk to someone and, or you know like hey, you messed up, let's try to do this this way. Do do we know who who's like, you know, or is it the blind leading the blind? Because from an outside looking wild. in it is Maldonado, but the problem with Maldonado right now is he's had two hits the entire well, season. The well, that's the problem, though. Like, who is the leader? So I always give credit to Pilar uh, might be in there. Everyone, well, everyone talks about Ethan Katz with Cease. I give a lot of credit to Cease to Rondon. Mm -hmm. I think that Rondon kind of showed Cease when he was here how to compete because I think Rondon has a lot has had a lot of injuries, so he's figured out how to compete. And I've never had a doubt about him as a competitor. Where I think Jolito lacked that and sees at some points like they weren't competitors. And Rondon really taught those guys how to compete. Um, even when Lance Lynn was there, at times you could be like, you know, any pitching wise, Lance Lynn was like the guy that was like the, the in the staff right now from a veteran standpoint. I thought the reason they had Jesse Chavez as a veteran in the pen was to kind of help those younger guys kind of get red pen ready. Mm -hmm. And then maybe a guy in the, you know, it would be Mike, I think, Clevenger when he comes back. Uh, being there, but right now from the staff standpoint, it's a young staff. So you would hope yeah. that Maldonado doesn't worry so much about his hitting and is really, you know, trying to make that happen uh, from a leadership standpoint. I, I'm going to talk, I'm going to be honest, I really Gavin Sheets, I think, has uh, the ability to do it because he grew up around the game. He knows the game of baseball. I think everybody respects him. Uh, he goes about his job the right way. And I think he should be somebody that the young players, the guys that are like kind of trying to figure it out, gravitate to him uh and on the pitching staff i like that crochet's already been been dropping comments saying yeah, you know yeah. we need to get this we need to i hope that they don't think that because they, they don't have the gears in the big leagues i hope that crochet and cheats really just follow their kind of their personalities and really take a grasp of that club out it's like no one needs to tell them and say hey you're the leader just go and take it right and we talked about it cheats has been more vocal He's yeah. one of the only guys talking to the media and being held accountable and holding himself accountable along with his players. And I noticed that since spring training. And the problem is, or it's something that like in the past, maybe not this year because he's one of the only guys performing at this time. But the fact that Gavin Sheets is your leader when on any other ball club, he Ozzie might be the Ozzie last guy. No, but I, I want I just want to say this in regards to Gavin Sheets. Now, I do agree that his optic makeup and his genetic makeup, he's a baseball player, comes from a baseball family. The way he carries himself, you know, you don't really have to worry about the professional element of him. Now, when I think of leadership in regards to the White Sox, you got to have some White Sox DNA or it won't work because Jerry does not like going outside of the organization for, let's just say, uh, prominent leadership as, as regards to, we're not gonna get a premium talent outside. It's hard for the, the White Sox to develop a guy. So when I look at leadership with the White Sox, it has to come from a guy like Gavin Sheets, a guy that somebody was giving up on. Uh, last year, a perfect leader, Jake Berger, a guy who was leading from example, left for dead, came back like rose like the phoenix you know what i'm saying had enough uh success to be named an all-star so when he opens his mouth people could listen like those are the things that kenny williams and rick Hahn took for granted because all of the guys that they invested in aren't invested in the game of baseball well, let, let, i'm gonna say something real crazy right here and this is gonna break all the white Sox fans hearts up 
<laughs> I'm ready for it. We're, I mean, our hearts have been broken for yeah. the last. I've been years. depressed for four well, years. Saying, usually, who the, media, who the media and the fans label as the team leader mm -hmm. is usually the complete opposite of who the sure. team leader really is. Yeah, Ozzy Guillen, team captain, named hit 270, and he was a leader because he was never scared to tell anybody something to their face and he was the same guy if he was hitting or not hitting his job was catch the ball and he was like the guy that would protect the players but also call them out throughout his playing career and you can see Ozzy's list of rookies that were in there and you can watch the last Comiskey and see what leadership is as a player when Ozzy took over the job this is this is this is what you talk about culture change the first meeting that we had with the Chicago White Sox and the front office described Paul Konerko to us we thought Paul Konerko was Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> no. We thought Paul Konerko was so miserable. Ozzy went into spring training like, I cannot wait to get rid of this big pain because the way that everyone talked about it. And we're like, nah, man, you got to give the guy like an open mind, like, hey, stay fresh because Ozzy can have negative things and you'll put something mm -hmm. in someone's mind and say, I don't like this guy, I don't like this guy. And it's like, mm -hmm. hey, you don't know the guy. And Paul is very different than Ozzy. Paul is a very quiet guy. A guy that keeps to himself, and it takes a lot for him to open. Within the first three weeks of spring training, Ozzy knew that the problem of that team was not Paul Konerko. And the reason that Paul Konerko was so miserable was because Paul Konerko wanted to do things a certain way, and there was other team people on the team that had more years than him in the big leagues and were the leaders of the clubhouse. I'll say it, Carlos Lee, Magal Ordonez, that wouldn't let Paul Konerko be the right leader because he felt that he couldn't say something because Carlos would get mad or, Hey guys, we shouldn't have stretching optional. And for four years, they would be like, Paul, shut up. Well, here comes Ozzy and says, well, my stretching is not optional. And I like Paul Konerko how serious he is. And you guys are the problem. And those switches were made. So if Gavin Sheets sees the opportunity to call out Moncada, to call out Eloy, to call, he should say, Hey man, we're here. We're the record of three and fifteen is for everybody on the roster. So if we need to have a team fight or a team argument and guys calling on each other and doing all that, I think that's a big part. I think personally, that's been a big part of this problem with this team. Like like it happened. It happened when TA was a leader. Players didn't want him to be the leader. Then Grandal came. Grandal made all the decisions, and they didn't want Grandal. There hasn't been somebody within that clubhouse that's been able to take it, and it doesn't have to be a superstar. I think that this is really funny. The guy that used to be the leader in that clubhouse, the White Sox got rid of, and no White Sox fan ever mentions that player. And he's actually part of a team right now that plays really good baseball. Leary. And, oh, and from what I've heard, who? Also, the leader of that clubhouse. Who? He's a catcher. James McCann. Mm -hmm. McCann, hold on. Again, when you're talking about, I'm mute his ass for saying. That. <laughs> I saw James McCann interact with the pitching staff on a non, but like not during the season, and we're like, that's the guy that knows what who the pitcher's girlfriend is, what they're going through mentally. No, he's he's not lying. Like Adley Rutschman is a Gold Glove catcher that's DH in these. I'm muting your ass too. <laughs> but I mean, hey, is it, I'm saying I'm it's being not serious. Gonna, Gonzo, I'm not like, saying it's not going to get you wins, but when you're trying to build that culture, maybe yeah. Gavin Sheets is not going to. be Adley is the age because home they guy. need to have James McCann on the field at all times. Like seriously. I like I like him as a veteran player, but I, I saw enough of him as a starter. Like he had and one good fine. half season, but that's fine. But, but that's, that's fine. Not, that's saying, not that's just, what, there's a lot of this fan base that's like, why didn't he start? For years to come. Well, so. I'm saying that's I'm saying that's in the past. I'm talking about future wise, yeah, yeah. and that's why if Gavin Sheets really feels like, first of all, I always say that when you're a leader, you, you pretty much have to beat up everybody in the clubhouse. Gavin Sheets <laughs> has the physical, you know, it's really hard but, being a leader when you're like four two. I think Gavin can handle anybody in there. Yeah, and I think yeah. he's been around for long enough that I think that and and mind you, I think that this coaching staff needs help. Why? Previous coaching staffs that the White Sox have been successful under did not need a lot of leaders. Why? Don Cooper was a leader on his own. Greg Walker was a leader on his own. Ozzie Guillen was a leader on his own. This staff, I think, needs that leadership help because 
just the way the personalities are. I don't think the coaches are really outgoing. Well, let's talk about the new kids on the block that can lead by example. And we saw two big debuts this week on Monday. And first off, I just want to take a nice bow to myself just because last week I was the one that what said, the fuck? I can't <laughs> wait until Cannon and the screening get their call ups. Yeah. I thought it was going to be later in the season. You, you did I just say, don't trust the Gets. You used to say Nestrini. The other guy, no one had ever mentioned it. No, I said Cannon too. I was surprised that he was a white player because no one on Twitter had mentioned it. <laughs> 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 he was sick, fuck. But oh, he, went to, he went to Georgia. There's the line for y'all. Five innings, five Ks, three hits, two earned. Two walks, one home run, eleven whiffs. Gonzo using a whole segment to take a victory lap on. Yeah, I'm taking. I like it. I like I'm it. Take, I'm take. I I gotta humble myself. So, while we get into it, guys, um, for a, a rookie making his debut, his mound presence was unbelievable. That's that's what to me stuck out. But when you look at his stuff, unlike Cannon, his fastball was it was moving. The guys weren't really seeing it as well. His changeup was nasty. As you can see yeah. by the whiff percentage down here, 25% for fastball, that's above average for whiff on a fastball. Slider was up at 42% on that only 15. So 20% of his arsenal was the slider. The changeup was at 25%. That's below, obviously, but um, it was still moving. I don't think he was using it for strikeouts too much. He showed it a couple times out of those five strikeouts. But I just liked what he used in this outing. Um, I'm not sure what you guys, from what you guys saw on the TV, what really stood out to you guys with Nestrini. For me, it was that changeup that he was able to command with the fastball, of course, with his mound presence. Yeah, that yeah, that, that was uh, actually my favorite part of the whole outing, too, Gonzo. Because as a right-handed pitcher, you got to use your changeup to dive into the hitter. You have to use it to attack. And what Nick was doing was – he was starting his changeup on the inside corner, and it was breaking towards that belt buckle of the right-handed hitter. That's how you get guys to break their swing down and roll over on pitches and jam themselves. It's a unique tool that young pitchers could use to not only keep your pitch count down, but it's hard to barrel up a baseball when it's on your belly button. So I felt like he, it, it, he did a good job utilizing that, and also he did a good job grabbing strikes with his fastball, Gonzo. We watched Dylan C. struggle at times uh, throughout his development grabbing strikes with his fastball. Mm. Even the reliever, Davey Garcia, his fastball jumps all over the corner. But Nestrini, for the most part, was really reined in for his uh, first start. So I was really impressed, but that changeup really got me. I also wanted to add, because I forgot, for a rookie – Thought he threw sixty eight percent for strikes, which was kind of unheard of. With um, how many pitches he threw, I'm trying to remember where he ended up at. He did he did start to burn out there in the fifth inning a little bit, but I thought for his pitch count where it was at, I'm gonna pull it up here real quick. Yeah, I, th I think I think around that fifth inning though, guys. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's when all of most of his pitches was high leverage. Yeah. He, was, he was working a little bit harder than he was in that second through fourth. And once the fifth inning rolled around, it was like, okay. It gave Grafal the little tap on the shoulder, like, okay, get your ball head ass on the phone. Mm -hmm. Hit somebody up, text the bullpen or something, you know. But at a certain point, you never really felt like the game was out of hand, even with the little bit of turbulence on the base paths with Nick. Yeah, he ended at 74 pitches. Yeah, Gonzo, you mentioned uh, mound presence. The thing I had written down was he looked polished. You know, mm -hmm. like we were expecting Nick Nick, Nick Nistrini to, you know, see him sometime this season. It was mm -hmm. earlier than expected. But I was at the game with my family on Friday, and we saw Chris Flexen pitch. And we knew Flexen is probably on his way out anyway with Clevenger and everyone else that's, you know, starting to get healthy. But I'd much rather see what this young kid has in Nick Nistrini than Chris Flexen pitch again. Like we we don't need to see Chris Flexen pitch again, and that's where I'm interested where this season goes because I do want to see Nick Nestrini, I want to see Cannon, I want to see some of the younger guys, but this isn't a you know they talked about this isn't a rebuild. So with the addition of Tommy Pham and Mike Clevenger, like the young guys are kind of getting blocked. 
where it's like it's April. We're nine and a half games out. This is a wash. This is a wash season. I'd much rather try to. Damn, get hold on. The season's like over with already, below. <laughs> <laughs> it's, tough. it's tough scenes, man. It's I'm sorry to the, break. Sorry to break it to you. It's so not so I, much on the the team aspect, but more so the individual with the development. It needs to. It needs to switch. We were talking about this because Grafal seems to be very mindset of veterans over youth, mm-hmm. and we got to get that turned because it's all about in this rebuild the youth coming up here. But some of these veteran guys, they, they could be traded very soon, and that could include. Robert and some of these others like Fetty, they're more becoming trade assets because we, I don't think they can really um, cheat this rebuild. If if they're going to do this, they need to really clear it, cut all assets, get as much, um, you know, value back and start, you know, from zero, Mm -hmm. lay your foundation and go. And I know junior, you know, gave us the question of Grafal. And I just want to end. I don't think I answered that question, but if it was me, I'm firing Grafal and I'm bringing up Jersey and I'm saying, Hey, I want to see what you got for the first couple months because I'm going to bring up some of our position players like Montgomery and a couple of others probably in July, August. Mm-hmm. But I still want to, I want to get their at bats in AAA. Some of those other guys are in double A, so I need to get them up to AAA, get their at bats at AAA, then bring them up. So by the time that they all come up, it's going to be August, and I want to see what you got with our core for two months of baseball. And I'm going to decide if if you're the guy that I believe is going to move along with them for the next couple of years, or if you're not the guy from what I've seen for the past several months, then I'm going to go my own route. I might hire his dad. I don't know yet, but I'm going to find someone to line him up with my new core. That's not what they did previously. We've discussed that, but I think this is the time that you have to make that move and you can't just, you know, squander it. Um, But I want to move on to Cannon here for today's outing. He also kind of simulated um, Nestrini's outing. He goes five, gives up one. We can talk about if that was an error or not, but three hits, three Ks, only one walk. Again, he was also similar with the strike strikeout percentage at 68 yeah. pitches. Um, for him, though, like I said before, his fastball to me, they weren't fooled with it. They were barreling it up a little bit. Mm-hmm. But what I liked more so about him, and he was starting to mix that sinker more and to go along with that that change up and sweeper, which was really throwing them off. Yeah. Um, I want to see more of his mix because it's not really – popping out at you, but with his arsenal, he's able to mix it up on you and get outs. And that's what, um, as a guy who I thought was going to be a back end rotation, I was really impressed with his, the way hey, Gonzo, he, he, was you know, he was moving. You know who he looks like? He looks like our boy in Boston, Tanner Houck, with that repertoire. <laughs> now, with the thing with Cannon is he has to be careful pitching up in the zone because mm-hmm. left-handed batters get a nice yeah. look of what his arm slot and especially with it leaving its hand. And, uh, like, on TV, his pitches don't really have that much hair. He just uses extension, and it just jumps on you, right? So, mm-hmm. at that point, now, if I'm a catcher, Maldonado, make sure he stays in a position to where he's repeating his mechanics because he could get hurt like that. But more importantly, make sure he's not flying open and tipping his pitches because if he's going to be sinker, change up uh, breaking ball. I don't like using the word sweeper. I'm a dinosaur. But that breaking ball, <laughs> there's three pitches where he could televise just off of his arm slot alone. But he did a good job. We're keeping everything reined in, too, Gonzo. Uh, if you look at what Tanner Houck did today against uh, the Guardians, it's the same thing what Cannon did to the Royals this year. A lot of quick innings, a lot mm-hmm. of early swings in the account. And you really don't see that from young pitchers because they're trying to get a called strike with everything mm-hmm. out of their hand. You don't got to do that. He's got a bat for a fucking reason. Give him something to wave a wand at. Steal a strike. Use your repertoire. He did a good job this afternoon. I was really impressed. Yeah, I think he had, uh, what, like five or six whiffs? I mean, that was you know pretty good. I mean, he was making some With C-plus veteran... stuff, Dougie. It, was, yeah, it I... wasn't like he was throwing, like, firecracker stuff. It was like, right. oh, okay. He's yeah. pitching. 
I mean, yeah, he pit, he pitched great. He's gonna have uh, you know, he's gonna have some rough outings, and I don't want to really compare him to like a, a knuckleball pitcher, but you know, it's kind of like when he's on, he's on, and when he's off, he's gonna he's gonna get beat around the you know the block a couple times, you know. But uh, I mean, yeah, to echo your guys' comments or whatever, between the two guys making their you know debuts, I mean, phenomenal composure, man. I mean, no no real jitters on them or whatever. I mean, if you think about it, you know, this is what the third third pitcher to make their major league starting debut if you consider crochet you know right out of the gates it's it's nice i mean it's refreshing you know like I, the small wins you know these are the small wins we'll that take we gotta, them. yeah we do we gotta oh, take I, them this season man i think they're bigger than you guys think i i don't remember the last time in in the one week span where two guys looked so polished coming up to the big leagues and i'm looking at chris getz Barfield, Bannister coming in and saying, what, what can we develop on what side of the ball? And pitching always has a lot of value of if you have a lot of pitching, you can move for position players. Okay. Right. And if you have Crochet developing the way that he is right now, you have Nostrini, meaning stays in the same course. You have Cannon staying the same course. You have Betty for the next two years, okay? So you get to see what he does. You still have the guy Hiro in, in the minor leagues, who I, who I think personally is actually better than Nestrini and Cannon. Okay. All right. Uh, and then you got the guy Thorpe. Now you got guys within the rotation where you say, okay, this is going to be – guys are going to be fighting. You get into the Brandon McCarthy. He's so he, – the staff is so good, there's no space for this guy, which yeah. is a good thing to have. Hell so yeah. when you count the years, and this goes back to my four-year rule, 2024, okay, the year 2027, that season for the White Sox is extremely important. Two reasons. Pantera's last year of his contract, mm -hmm. so they will pick up those options. Ben Attendee's last year of his contract. Can't come okay? sooner. Ben Attendee, <laughs> ninth, playing left field, you can figure out a way to build a team where he's in it and doesn't have to be a superstar. And even though you're paying him that crazy money, you have potentially a third baseman or a shortstop in Colson, which is the reason I believe that he should be brought up as soon as possible. So we can figure out if he's going to be a third baseman or a shortstop, because I'm starting to believe he is going to be a third baseman. Mm -hmm. So the window is 24, 25, 26, 27, this pitching staff is on year four of big league pitching, mm -hmm. okay? Where you get a guy like Clevenger, again, you get to use him this year, hopefully flip him. You can – you now with the pitchers that are coming up, if you keep having the success, you keep letting these minor league guys go out there in their first year and letting them develop. Mm -hmm. They will have their bad starts. They're going to have their great starts, but you help them develop. Why? Because in those four years, you're going to find out if you are not going to have to go trade for anybody or sign a starting pitcher. And mm -hmm. everybody knows the starting pitcher is the most most expensive thing. So if these guys, if Cannon, Nestrini, and Hyrule, okay, if those three guys hit for them, the White Sox can be competing as, as early. We ain't as even as talking well. about Noah Schultz. No, yet. Schultz I was about to mention. And We're then not even Noah talking about Noah Schultz coming Schultz after that. Correct. Correct. And so, so now, and you can, so now you really, that's where I see the gold there. And here's the part where you brought up a young man in, who's very talented and very young in AAA, who, by the way, if Ozzy Guillen was to be mentioned as the manager on his list, when they asked him who would be the manager, he recommended that Noah would be his bench coach. Why? Because when you are over the age of 60, you don't think you're going to manage the next 15 years. And you would hope that the guy that what you're building is sitting next to you. And you're like, hey, you think this kid's that good? He should be in the big league staff so that you don't grab him and say, hey, go from AAA to the big leagues. Whoever the big, the next manager is, and in my opinion, let's take Ozzy out of the conversation because he's related to me. But it would have to be a guy with that mold, an Ozzy Guillen, a Buck Show Walter, Somebody that has done it, who has built a culture, meaning 
I like Buck because he's done it in like five different teams where Buck has prepared them. He is the grand master of it and saying, Hey, we're going to not, we're going to compete, meaning we're going to play 500 ball. That's our goal for the next three years. And maybe one of those years you get crazier and you win more games, yeah. but that development is going to put you in a situation where in that 2027, you know what you have. And then in 2028, when you look at all those free agents, including Pantera, including Ronald Acuna, including all these young players that are that have signed early on, you can go and say, now I can go in and if I have to go get a big time bat, I can go do that. And you really let this thing run out and really know what you have. I don't think the rebuild failed. I really think that the rebuild was not put together and they jumped the gun and spend money when they did not know what they had. Yes. Okay. They went crochet in Oakland. And now we're finally seeing crochet as a starter now. Yeah. And that's like a three year run. So had they kept Ricky and kind of seen like where this was going, you might've been able to make moves in seasons like now and say, Hey man, this guy's not working out and kind of everyone will still have their jobs. But I think if there's a, if there's a North star for the Chicago White Sox, with all due respect to all the position players that are on the offensive side, I think that the White Sox power right now is in that pitching talent that they have that is young. And they need to hone that. And I really don't hope that they go and trade it to bring in veteran guys mm -hmm. to try to have this quick fix. And yeah. they flip a guy like Ding Dunning. Again, yeah. Dude, yeah. Lane Lansford gave you a playoff. Dang, Dunn is still eating innings for the Rangers till his day. Right. And he got a ring. Saying, that's what I'm saying, though. So you gave up Dane Dunning, who you had under control. Yes, Lansford got you to the playoffs, but the kind of pitching was the same. So in hindsight, you're like, well, they could have kept Dane Dunning. You know, this, again, I don't think that – I hope that they don't move these young pitching arms, yep. including Noah Schultz, who, again, I think he's – But you have to know. scout – you have to really scout your arms to flip them because they're going to have to do so. There's so many arms coming up, not just Noah. You got Mason Adams, Grant Taylor. There's several arms coming don't, up. You don't flip any of them until you have a staff of five or six guys that you're like, these guys are going nowhere. You don't touch any of them. You put them all in the bullpen. Don't move arms. Don't get Tatis with an arm. The Sox have the gold mine right now with pitchers. I think that and, – and, and I'm talking about goldmine with pitchers, and you guys know I hate prospects because when they brought them up to the big leagues, they have not looked like they're shitting their pants, and they look like in their first game in the big leagues that they can actually develop and pitch at this level. That's what I like about it. Those These guys are giving us five innings. They, these guys have thrown five look innings. At, there has been it for three years. To your point, OJ – Look at the limited amount of mound visits between these young guys are starting. We're looking at guys maturing right before our eyes with the first start, second start. I don't have to worry about Nick Destrini, start number two. I don't have to worry about Cannon, start yeah. number two. And like, they're going to get hit. The, and they're going to get hit. But they're not going to get – I remember, and this was so funny. The they're night not going to get roped Michael like Kopech. Andre Rienzo or nobody. I bet the bums were there. The night that Michael Kopech. Okay, made his major league debut. We were the hell was it? It almost got made into a holiday. It was oh, yeah. raining. NBC Sports. They were like Chuck was throwing champagne. It was like <laughs> it was like Batman was coming out, and they made such a big deal. Oh, look! If he threw ninety nine, and and yeah. ben, ben, Benetti was like drooling. <laughs> I was drooling too. I, I mean, I'll admit it. I was no, drooling. When, when at, hold on. When you look at his starts, compare start by start. These kids have come in. There has been no hype. I said some people are like, "Who's this guy, Cannon?" I said he yeah. went to Georgia. He pitched in the in the All Star game. Just because yeah. they look good, they don't have a crazy beard. But mind you, probably the hottest two pitchers that have come out pitching That's in a long true. time: Scott Pitsetnik hot and Juan Moncada hot. I like it. I no, but I'm saying though, with like, it's not your typical guy that you're like, oh my god, like White Sox fans love like the Bobby James, like they love that, like. These guys look like Lance Broadway that it can actually pitch. They just yeah. did it so yeah. nonchalant, like so like nothing. And when you look at their comparisons and like what they did in their first start compared to all these other guys that they made into these superheroes, mm -hmm. they actually look better. Yeah. Well, Cannon's a kid that I'm hoping he really picks the mind of Fetty because they got similar stuff. 
and but they can... before he went to, to, to Korea or after? <laughs> Both before and no. after. He has but... to know how it works if you if you fight right. so if you go to suck. Korea. <laughs> well, yeah, no, we don't want Cannon to go to Korea though. We we need no, to we don't want no, no, no. But he yeah. needs a you know he needs a <laughs> minor part of how that's you know why he came to develop that sweeper that you know obviously he's starting to throw so. And develop it here. And that's the thing. They yep. threw it here. They threw it to big league hitters. They threw it to Salvador Perez. My dad no fucking motion machine. No, Bobby Bobby a is, Jr. My dad said today, if I took 10 at bats in triple A, I get four hits at 60 years old. Triple A is triple A for a reason. Double A is double A for a reason. Guys are just hacking, good pitching. Guys are throwing hard. Like big leagues is the big leagues for a reason. In, mm -hmm. in Michael Kopech in Triple A threw the pitch that he threw today in Double A or Triple A, and that batter an is going to yeah. swing ninety nine point nine percent of the time. In the big leagues, it's in the it's in the jumbotron. That's why mm -hmm. the big leagues are so hard. So to learn the big league level, it takes time. So I love that these guys are going to get all of twenty twenty four healthy, and guys are going to get hurt. Guys are going to get sure. you know they're going to get injuries. So that's why I like the amount of arms. And if one thing has been super positive this year as a whole. For the White Sox has been that starting staff because every guy, not the guy Soraka that came in the trade, yeah, he he should, he should be looking around saying, "Oh my God, oh uh, I just went from <laughs> number two to like, oh boy, uh, Clevenger better takes longer because I might go yeah. to the bullpen." Yeah, I was just yeah. about to say when I'm looking at the rotation, he's the arm that I'm eyeing. And yeah, you got Hyro and Thor. He either needs to step it up to get that trade value up, or he's going to be DFA'd. You go to the bullpen, but yeah, if I'm bullpen, saying that, like. Yeah, you go to the book, but you want that competition. Like, if you're a baseball player, and this is where fans kind of don't realize that, it's like when you're at work and they bring somebody new and you're like, man, that guy's better than Absolutely. me in my job. You got to step yep. it up. Mm -hmm. So he knows, yes, I came in this trade. And he, he reads the newspaper. He knows that they got Thorpe in the minor leagues and they got this kid, Noah Schultz, and they got the future. You know, there's more arms coming. So you either step it up to stay in that rotation or step it up to get moved. But you better right. step it up because there's somebody – and that level of competition has never been there. We gave we gave Colas the right field job. We gave Nick Madrigal second base. We gave everybody. Oh, here, here, here. Mm -hmm. Like, it, we, no one's ever earned it except Berger, pretty much. Yeah. This is the first year where these guys are going to have to compete for their job. So I would say that the, the pitching is probably the strong point, the starting pitching with those with the, that future. So real quick, um, I want to get – before we get into the other channel with the, the bum cast guys, Dougie, Baloney, yeah. when you guys were in the 108 tourney, I saw a really <laughs> nasty Goodfellas video. So I, I want you to talk to us about your creativity before we get into what you guys got going on over there. Yeah, so credit to um, first the 108 guys for putting on the tournament because it's so much fun. It was both Dougie and I. Uh, our second year in the tournament and we uh, so I'll talk about um, our co-host Johnny and Jason. Uh, we started the Chicago sports bums a long time ago as a blog. I mean, we like, this was like 2012, 2013. We thought we were like Portnoy and big cat, just going to blog about <laughs> Chicago sports and stuff like that. And then we took a long ass break. And then during COVID we started up as a podcast because we had nothing else to do. You know, you're isolated, you're at home, you're, we're doing things and like, you know, let's just talk about sports. Um, our friend Joey P was a longtime White Sox Twitter guy. He was in the 108 tournament. I didn't know anything about White Sox Twitter. I didn't know anything about, you know, the 108 or anything like that. But we're like, ah, oh, we gotta support. We gotta support our our hermano. We we call Joey P our hermano. Uh, so we learned, or like I we I fired back up the Twitter. I was always on Twitter, but never on White Sox Twitter. Um, and I'm like, holy cow, this is a whole community, and. From there, like, you know, we met the 108 guys. We met, like, uh, everywhere on uh, Pinwheels and Ivy. And Herb Lawrence has been a really good friend and supporter of ours. Um, but we're like, all right, let's start doing this. Let's start doing content. You know, we love the White Sox. This is, like, a, I want to credit you, Ozzy, Ozzy Jr., because you mentioned it, like, this is a hustle for us. We all got side jobs. I mean, we got full-time jobs and stuff like that. But this is a passion project. And... Like as soon as soon as it starts feeling like work, we don't want to do it anymore. But it doesn't feel like work. This is fun. Like we like doing this. We like talking about the White Sox, the Bears, different things like that. So when we got put in the 108 tournament, 
Dougie came out last year with a fire video, like freestyle rapping something. And I'm like, who? Like, holy cow. And immediately I talked to, you know, like my my co-host, Jason, or like, we got to bring in Dougie Fresh because he had been to a couple of our tailgates. Yeah, we talked to him. We met him a couple of times and like he's just like a like just a creative mind. And I think like that's where we all blend in together. Like we all have our our traits and like our, our things that make us work. But when we come together, like the Goodfellas video, it just like something like it. We don't know how to video edit. Like I'm a landscaper by trade. Like I, I ran a landscaping company for 20 years. Dougie, you work for the city. Like you're an operator. Yeah. But like if you like doing it, if it you know, if you if you have a passion for it, let let it rip. So we made this Goodfellas video and I feel like it, I mean, it took, you know, the one way tournament by storm. And realistically, we filmed that video. I had the idea for it. And I'm like, I'm going to save it for later in the tournament. And then when B Flow put out the brackets, yeah. I was up against Colleen Carmody, who's got a huge following with the ass crew, uh, the all sports scene crew. And she's got a big following on Bears Twitter, which I'm not a part of. We're trying to get into Bears Twitter, but I'm not a part of. So I panicked and I'm like, we got to release this video first round and like, you know, kind of like catch it by storm. And that's what we did. Um, but credit to all of the bums, Dougie, and and credit to our wives too, because yeah. we all got kids. We all shout got, out, like, ladies. <laughs> like, and Julie is the one filming our dumbasses, and and Mary was watching the kids at our place. That Dougie's wife watching all of the kids at our place while we're running around the yard filming just crazy things. Um, but but it's just fun, and that's what it's about. Like it's like I say it all the time. As soon as it starts feeling like work, I don't want to do it because I got a job. We all got a job, and we don't want to do it. But I love White Sox Twitter. I love creating content. I love doing the bum cast and like you know hopping on your guys' show. So we appreciate the platform and things like that. But yeah, man, it, it's fun, and that's what we're. That's basically what we're about. Oh yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you guys just like a little peek behind the curtain, uh, how the conversation really went. It was just, they called me up and they were like, Hey, you like whiskey and you're white and we need a white guy. That was yeah, pretty much true. it. <laughs> we, that's true. We got, we got three Mexicans. Dougie, the white guy was the diversity hire. <laughs> I did not know. Got to check them boxes. Below. I didn't yeah, know they were all Mexicans. So I started like yeah. really bad. I'm like, yeah, these guys are all Mexicans. Cause obviously they all got their, their, uh, their names. So I love the bum. Again, I'm a fan of the show. Okay. And the, and the reason that I like shows and podcasts, I know people have been out there like, oh, there's like 300 shows on, you know, a White Sox podcast. And I'm like, right. there can be a thousand. And, and there's an argument because there's like this White Sox Twitter world. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then there's, there's Chuck. Okay. And Ozzy yeah. Guillen yeah. who get paid a lot of money to do the NBC. Okay. Yeah. There's this middle world up here. Where they all want to be Chuck and Ozzy, mm -hmm. okay? But but everyone that does content for free is better than everyone in the middle world. So that's why I enjoy it so much because the actual takes and the creativity and the things that like the bum cast come in as a listener, I'm like, dude, these guys have better takes than the people that are getting paid for this. I'm texting my boss, Mitch Rosen. I'm like, yeah, there's I, I'm gonna come back and start working at the score again. There's better talent. People do this for free. The guys that are getting paid guys in the industry. And it's like a thing because it's like you enjoy it as a fan. And again, your personalities come in and then you go into this tournament. And again, you guys are not editors. Everyone that gets paid for this, I'm sure learn how to edit in school. I'm yeah. sure made a living off of this. There's no creativity. So I'm like the best content came from that crew. So I also think like the 108 is like the community and yeah. there's all like, there's all these hoods, the bum, the one, the, the bum hood, Everyone's got like their clicks and you guys are super creative. So when I looked at like the brackets, I actually told Gonzo, I said, Gonzo, we're going up against no one that's creative until we get to beef from a creativity standpoint. I was like, if we were getting matched up against some of these guys and other people, I was like, I'm going to have to be doing some, I'm going to have to like actually go and step up my game. Like literally took his clothes off. I'm being serious because I was like, the <laughs> that was some awesome. Of are, some of these people are super creative. And like that's the passion of it, and I think it's great because I'm like, dude, these people are not getting paid for this, which makes it that much better. But that was one of the great. I, I actually that's the only video <laughs> tagged 
I, I tagged Ozzy, but I actually grabbed it. I filmed it from my phone and I send it in our group chat to Ozzy and like our white, like our like our family chat. And everyone's like, oh my God, this is awesome. Because they were like, this is really it was unique. It was cool. We enjoyed it. Uh, and I, hopefully you guys participated in it because it was just awesome. So no, keep, keep putting it out. No, but like likewise, like you killed it. I, I feel like you could have just been like, oh, cool. I'm in this tournament and, and that's it. But you took, you know, the bull by the horns. And I, if I'm in this, I'm going to do this. So when I saw that video, credit to you, like. I, I'm a bigger dude. I don't know if I would have took my shirt out in public and it, eventually maybe I will, you know, for the right, you know, for the right matchup in the tournament or whatever. But the I fact thought he's going to say for the right price. Well, that's yeah. true. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, below, I, I'm, I'm building out a website, maybe baloney fans, baloney, but, but no, no, but, but the way you the put yourself out the there, Ozzy credit to you because that, that took some balls and, and you're like, you know what? I'm doing this. So that was awesome. Yeah, CHGO didn't really see him taking a shirt off, you know. <laughs> they weren't expecting it. <laughs> they were not expecting but it. But it was easy, though. Like, when Dougie hit me up about, like, are you going to endorse? And people think, like, I only endorse, number one, because pe people thought that, like, Dougie and I, like, knew each other. Because they're like, oh, you. I'm like, I've never met him. Yeah, I, was like, right. I, know who I, I was like, I know who he is because of the show that he's on. And I know, like, what he belongs to. But I was like, I'm, I'm actually technically would be like, I'm a, he reached out to me. I'm a fan. I said, yeah, hell yeah, I'll endorse you. Like, I know what you do. Right. So it's not like people think that I'm going, like, you know, with this endorsement. It happens with Gabe, like Gabe, for example. Yeah. People think, like, I was like, I met Gabe at a White Sox fest, and I was mm -hmm. so intrigued with him that I started following him on Twitter. And I'm like, I follow, like, the stuff that he puts on, like, the running. Like, I actually fo I follow him. He doesn't follow yeah. me. So, right. of course, I'm going to. So that part is, like. People think that because of your last name or like even Ozzy, like when you're on Twitter, we're just, we're also consuming. Just like we block people, we're like, we want to follow this guy or this mm -hmm. person or this page because of the stuff that they're saying is actually funny. And it relates to stuff that I either follow, like, or that we have in common. So that's why I think about it's like really cool about the Twitter world is like, you're going to hear, like we've heard White Sox takes from people that are in the industry. Yeah. And it's like we want to hear takes that we either find that are relevant, that are new, that are fresh, that are that have common sense. You're like, hey, look at these fans. They're having a great time. And the stuff that they're sharing is actually really good. It's better than some of the stuff that's from people that are getting paid all this money to do. Their takes are better. Yeah. I, I feel like there's like that middle ground that you're talking about. I feel like they're uh they're afraid to be wrong, you know, because right. When they when they are wrong, like that's how they're judged to get to that next level. Whereas me, I'm still gonna have a job in the morning. I can look like an asshole every single Monday night, and most Monday nights I do. You should go look, go back and look at our spelling bee challenge. I can't spell <laughs> yeah. for shit. None of us can. We're blue collar guys. Yeah, I can't spell for shit. I was a laughing stock of White Sox Twitter for a whole month. But what do I care? I don't give a shit. End of the day. My family's going to have food on their table. I'm going to have a job. I'm going on vacation. I'm doing my thing. I'm having fun. And that's what it's all about is having fun, right? Hey, I mean, Doug. I'm, yeah. Not, I'm, I'm not going to lie, bro. At yeah. a certain point, these people can't laugh at themselves anymore. Ah, dude. Like, I, like I, we, we, we spend all day trolling, cracking jokes about other people. All of a right. sudden, now we crack joke. Now we're the butt of the joke. Now it's showtime's over. No. My best internet experiences are when some I'm getting the hell roast out of me, like chestnuts on an open fire. Yes. I laugh my ass off just like the same fucking people in the crowd. And this is where we got to credit the 108 guys once again, because they take a lot of the ball busting. And, and me and my cousin Johnny, who's also on the bump cast, he we're from like the same neighborhood growing up. My uncles, if or like. If we're not busting your balls, we don't love you. And and that's the thing, like, you know, that's how we communicate is by busting balls and by making jokes. But at the end of the day, you know, it's all love. So a lot of the times, especially on Twitter, the people that can't take a joke, that's where things go and snowball in a different direction. But as long as we can laugh at ourselves, like if 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 I can make fun of Dougie, Dougie makes fun of me. 
our Jason or Johnny, we make fun of each other because we've known each other for, you know, 20 years in, in Jason's case. And I grew up with my cousin Johnny. So like we're all busting balls because we're family, but we can take it too. And, and yeah. that's where a lot of the times where, you know, things get miscommunicated on Twitter. Yeah. I, I mean, there, there was a whole thing or whatever when, so I, I'm a uh, half season for the uh, Blackhawks. Okay. So uh, the Cubs convention or Cubs con was going on at the time. So they had the Cubs in the skybox. They got booed at the Hawks game, like no high hell. Okay. And so I filmed it and I posted it on Twitter and the thing went viral and all I got was, you know, Cub fans, oh, there's one guy booing into a mic, yada, yada. There was a whole bunch of whatever. But then there were a bunch of, like, third-grade fucking comments. It was just like, just looked at your profile, bro. You're fat. I'm like, I know. I look at myself in the mirror every fucking day. You don't think I know that I'm fat? You know? Like, <laughs> I mean, like, dude, you know, like, it was just, dude, there's, like, that level of Twitter where, like, people think, like, I mean, dude. We've all been, we all grew up in the non social media times where, like, you were South made Park fun of. At, dude, you were made fun of at school and shit like that. Like, shit said to your face. Shit that said over the internet, you think I give two fucks? Like, I was taking that shit at school to the face. Like, if you think I give a shit about, you know, stranger with, you know, like some random picture, <laughs> I don't give a shit. You know, like, I don't care. You know, yeah. like, I, the best thing that I could do is just not even engage with them because then it, he's talking to nobody right into the black hole with your fucking ass. I don't care. The, the last thing I'll say about the, you know, the quote unquote cesspool of Twitter is while there is, you know, like I said it in the Goodfellas video, it's a dysfunctional family. Every family has their fights. Every family has their ups and downs. But at the end of the day, we're there for a common good. We all love the White Sox. We're all passionate about the White Sox. And they're definitely way more good than bad on White Sox. Mm -hmm. At least in our opinion. Because the Whiskey at Comiskey Tailgates and all of like the other communities, like you mentioned, all the other cliques, while they are cliques, at the end of the day, they all come together. And when you sit at the 108 and when like My Sox Summer, Beef Loaf, and Trees are sitting up there, there's no one fighting. I know there's people that don't like each other. They're sitting like, you know, kitty corner from each other or this mm -hmm. and that. But at the end of the day, everyone's respectful. Everyone like is there to try to watch the White Sox win, even though they don't win all that much. But in my opinion, like there's way more good that comes from White Sox Twitter than bad. He said you're better. Just, Justin and I are the we, you. The one other thing that I admire about you guys, you guys are bringing that is that you guys are very, very even keel like you guys do your thing you guys have your jokes you guys do your show people come at you guys and you guys are just very like just smooth oh, justin, and I come for, justin and i have we had to go to uh anger management <laughs> yeah for, but no, so we, we so we appreciate when when people like you guys that are out there you know are able to handle this stuff because i'm like dude they're like there and they're in the community like I'm like I don't think I don't know if I could do that because I was like I got I got I go nuts like I got profiles on people like I know where they work what they do and I'm like yeah. I got like files and I'm like so yeah. I admire people that are out there that you guys are like really out there you guys are just even keel um, just like the 108 guys where you guys are very and even your takes like you guys again there's been a lot of controversial White Sox situations mm -hmm. where things have come up where you guys give your point and like are able to like say your thing and it's respected. And no one picked, like you guys are able to just handle both sides that are coming at you for whatever reason. So kudos to that. Thank you. Perfect example to your point. So last year uh, during the tournament, like Baloney was saying, um, I started off as a solo, no podcast, no nothing. Um, I made it through two rounds by myself. You know, third round, I get to this guy named Jer. Jer's a good dude. Awesome. At that point for the third round, I had made my debut episode on the bum cast or whatever, as I am about to face him, he got, I don't want to say butthurt, but he kind of was sour after he lost and was like, Oh, you know, this is a credit to the bums. And then started calling us the bum cartel. Okay. 
So we started calling this a bum cartel, which is now probably our third best selling shirt in our merch store. Yeah, we could have taken offense to it. You know, I was like, you know what? Let's make it a shirt and let's just roll with it. Y'all got or hoodies? So we started selling. Send me a fucking, hey, Dougie, send me a link right now. Yeah, dude. So so then we just started selling t-shirts and he was like, oh, what the fuck? You know, like. But at the end of the day, now Jer Taco Gladiator is his Twitter handle. He's part of the crew. He comes to the tailgates. He's one of my favorite people on White Sox Twitter. Absolutely. So you can find a good. So I was gonna ask you guys that. So you guys, one of the one of the catches things you guys have again. There's a lot of podcasts out there. Okay. Heather Tate, your merch is very good. Thank you. Uh, that, so, yeah, that's a, that's that's a total credit to Johnny. But I'm saying, like, you guys are very creative in your merch creation. So I got to give you guys credit for that because, like, you guys, like, you guys are like, oh, I'm like, okay, I I would rock that. Um, that that's cool because again, I rock. I could rock stuff. I haven't rocked the White Sox logo in since 2011 okay. um uh but yeah i only rocked the guardians logo justin yeah i heard about that the you make me sick team, i told you the fantasy you team's a lot of guardians i heard about that in the pre-show meeting yeah 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 there's Bro. a lot of guardians on my fantasy team that's yeah. why is that that that's why his ass is getting whooped right now. No, but thank you. Yeah, we do take pride in our merch, and our, our merch is designed by my cousin Johnny, the Southside Bum. Um, but we all have ideas, and we all kind of bounce off each other and stuff like that. And at the end of the day, if you do buy a shirt, and we tell this, and it's full transparency, all the money we make, and we like we sent this is a bourbon bum shirt that we raffled off a bunch of bottles of bourbon for whoever bought a shirt. All of that money goes back into the Whiskey at Comiskey tailgates. So the Whiskey at Comiskey oh. tailgates is something we do uh, six times a year. And we started last year. This is our second year fully doing it. Um, whiskey, beer. If you don't drink, food is provided a lot yeah. A lot of the time. Now we got Chef Ruddy, uh, Chicago Fight Sox cooking up stuff for us. Um, Everything's free. You just show up to Lot B. You know, we'll hand you if you don't need you know, water, pop, food, drinks, music's going, and that's how we've fostered our community. And I honestly, that's how we've set ourselves apart because we don't ask. Yep, I, I went. <laughs> funny story. So that Jerry the Clown shirt is our bestseller. I talked to White Sox Dave about it a long time ago because I was like. That shirt got famous because Roger Goodell and Dave Pornoy, like, yeah. you know, he put the clown shirt. And I asked Dave, like, Dave, is there any chance you guys make a, a, a Jerry Reinsdorf version of the clown shirt? And he's like, no. He's like, I can't. Dave Portnoy is really protective about the IP. And he's like, I, like, Barstool won't do it. So we're, I was like, if Barstool's not going to do it, <laughs> we'll do it. And I we made the shirt with all intents, like we're like we're gonna get a cease and desist. Like obviously, like we, we just stole that idea. It's been three years running, and that shirt's made gangbusters. But like but I it's, said, it's, it's not cherry. That, that that yeah. So that shirt, but that's funded the food, the whiskey, yeah. the beer for all of the tailgates. So the next one is May 11th in Lot B, um, the last tailgate for the home opener. We had the barstool guys there. John Schriffen showed up for a little bit. We talked to everybody before he made his debut in the stands. Um, and it was Big just cool. Fan, it's just, by the way. I, I think so too. Oh, we're, yeah, yeah. I mean, now we're Schriffen guys, all things considered. You know, he came and, and talked to everybody, but I think he's doing a really good job making, like we talked about, chicken salad out of chicken shit. Like, I, I think he is cultivating his own brand and his own way of calling a game. So I, I do like that. But yeah, um, whiskey at Comiskey. We'd love to have all you guys. It's yeah. it's been a it's been a really good success for us, and we appreciate everyone that supported because we do have you know like the 108 guys supported us. Josh Nelson um, was a big influential factor. He showed up to a bunch of the early ones where there was only like ten people there, um, and we're gonna do the road trip with them. So Sox Machine 108 and the Chicago Sports Bums are teaming up to do a Milwaukee road trip on June 1st in Milwaukee. We're basically bringing whiskey at Comiskey straight up north. And um, the Sox Machine and the 108 guys have done these road trips before. And they they talked about maybe having to do like 300, 400 people. And we're just along for the ride. So we appreciate all of the support. We appreciate your guys' support. But it's yeah. been a fun ride. 
are these set dates for the whiskey at Comiskey or yeah. is it just, yeah, there's set dates. Uh, I'll tweet them out. I'll send them to you guys, but there's, okay. it's May 11th. There's the last Saturday in June, uh, the last Saturday in July. And then we're doing a special one for Cub Sox Saturday in August, where we have Michters who did our opening sponsorship. Uh, they're coming back with a bunch of Michters whiskey and we got some good food for that day too. So yeah, and actually, this uh, May 11th, we've got the uh, the rep coming out from uh, Maker's yeah Maker's Mark. Mark. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So we're actually going to have a whiskey rep out there serving drinks to people for free. Amazing. Yeah. So more talent in the in the org. Uh, I don't know why Gonzo's inquiring. It sounds like fun. He's allergic to fun, but I'll be <laughs> <laughs> more than welcome. Yeah. yeah, I can't remember what day I fly in to Chicago, if it's 11th or 12th. But if, I, if I'm if i in, I'll try to make it. That's for sure. It sounds like somebody um, needs to change a flight. <laughs> <laughs> now! Unfortunately, the day job takes priority here in San Diego. Yeah. But um, what else you guys got um, coming up on the, the channel with uh, Chicago Sports Bumps? Yeah, so we do the Bumcast every Monday night, and that's our flagship show. That's where we talk sports and drink whiskey. That's our whole thing. We are primarily a White Sox podcast to start, like, the season. But then, like, so this Monday, the Bears draft is coming. So we're going to have Gas Money Bob on. Internet famous Gas Money Bob. He's an awesome character, um, big Bears fan. So he's going to help us break down the draft the following week. Um, we're going to talk results of that draft with, um, Rob Schwartz Jr. of Bear Goggles On. So we try to do a little bit of everything. We are mostly a Bears and White Sox podcast, but every so often, you know, the Blackhawks are doing good. Dougie and our guy, Joey P have half season tickets. So if Connor Bedard does something good, we'll talk Blackhawks. And a lot of the times we're not really sports heavy. We try to do maybe 30, 45 minutes of like, sports takes and then the rest of the show is full nonsense our our community is really cool comments uh we'll do spelling bees one time we'll do like 90s nostalgia shows we try to make it as fun as possible yeah, yeah. spelling spelling bee i would get uh i think i would pass out on the dude end. dude we were so bad people were laughing at us beef loaf was in the comments like i can't believe you guys are adults because we were like failing yeah. like fourth grade spell fourth grade word Dude, it's, I, about, it's about it's about telling not spelling that's what i tell people nah. yeah so for those of you listening on the pod um maloney's wifey puts into our chat that whiskey at comiskey dates are may 11th june 29th july 27th august 10th and september 14th this is better than giveaway um, days at the white Sox. Dude, they really I'm is the you. food. The food is fantastic. That's literally no joke. You're getting fed. You're getting fed in those drinks. Like, like this is this is way better than a giveaway from a shirt from an Irish t-shirt from St. Patty's Day, like halfway through St. Patty's. Yeah. So when does uh on May 11th? When does it start at? So as, we get as there. Soon as a lot as, opens. <laughs> as soon as a lot opens, we set up. We tell people two and a half hours before first pitch, but like opening day. They open the lots early because there's a lot of people there. We tailgated for longer than the game was played. We tailgated <laughs> for about three and a half hours, and the game only lasted like two fifteen or something like that. Yeah, so <laughs> it's it's a fun time. It is really yeah. cool, and you know what? It's also a great place. Like if you haven't met any people off of White Sox Twitter, or if you just want to like be a part of the community and start like making new friends. I mean, you would be shocked. How many people like are maybe like considered like an asshole or a tough guy? But as soon as they hit that like lot B over by the bum flag, everybody's friends, and it's it's always a good time. And then also too, uh, I've been known to bring some cigars too. So if you guys are yeah. into cigars, big cigar guy. So big cigar guy myself. That's awesome. Absolutely. I know where, I know where Mike Clevenger is going to do his next signing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have the peace. <laughs> yeah, right. So it says lot B two and a half hours before first pitch. Look for the this bumps awesome. flag. Um, awesome. Yeah. So the we game gotta... the game is a six ten start, so approximately what three thirty? Yeah, we'll be in there by three. We'll be set up by three thirty. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I just actually checked my schedule. My flight is at 6 a.m. on Saturday, so I should be arriving at noon. So there we go. That's what I'm talking about. Justin, I have to hit you up, pick you up from somewhere. We got to head. I'll be there before you. (laughs) Bastard. All right. (laughs) (laughs) So, guys, Dougie, Baloney, we've took almost two hours of your time. No, I haven't. Thanks for joining us. Um, Is there. Real quick, you want to shout out anything else? You have any other shout outs here? No, nah, th- I mean, I think that's it. You know, like we appreciate everyone. We appreciate your support. We, you could find us at Shy Sports Bums. That our, that's our Twitter page. We're on Instagram and TikTok. But um, yeah, it's the four of us. You know, Dougie Freshness, myself, the head bum in charge, Jason, Southside Bum Johnny, um, and then we have uh, some new people coming along. Joey P's in the mix. Our, uh, our friend Aaron. All of their wives are on Twitter, you know, helping up, stuff like that. It's a full community. So uh, yeah, thank we, you, guys. Yeah, and we do have – we do actually have a sister uh, thing, uh, Bums in the Bleachers. With, oh, uh, yeah, that's a good point. You know, so, I mean, got to bring them up. But, you know, we'll just leave it for that. Uh, Mike Prez and uh, John, and so they're, if, they're pretty good. But If you guys know of Cubs fans, not yeah. that we are any – association i don't but... know anybody named mike presnowski or yeah. any other cubs fans <laughs> in yeah. history and or otherwise they are the cubs version of the bums if you will <laughs> but i will tell you this and i'm going to leave you with this um i have started a campaign against the campfire milkshake and i want to use <laughs> this time you. i want to use this time <laughs> to uh talk about that uh it's the say no to jerry's shake hashtag uh, i have started it on twitter um I will not be distracted by a milkshake. Put a team on the field. I like that. By the way, you can't even get it unless like you're in like a special level, right? Yeah, the yeah. Vizzy View Bar. Yeah, 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 you can get it like unless you uh, unless you're like in a special like section or something. Yeah, it's not available to the pores. Yeah, <laughs> you just gotta make your bums. <laughs> oh, 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 so this is funny. So the reason I know that was opening day. The trade off was you want Ozzy to throw the first pitch. He's got to get a sweet. Mm-hmm. So we went as a family. So obviously everybody's like, oh, this milkshake. So we're like, oh, get some. They ain't done so it. Got a ring. The girl comes and we asked her, said, hey, well, you know, we don't see the milkshake in the menu. Oh, we don't serve the milkshake. Hey, what do you mean you don't serve the milkshake? You've been promoting it for, for three weeks. Yeah. Oh, well, we'll do you a favor. We'll go get one for you guys. <laughs> we'll do you a favor. <laughs> so they went and got one for us. And it was like this big deal. They brought this shake from this one section. And nobody. And we're like, why is the shake not in the menu? Like, so it was, uh. We're a little thrown off by that. It was good. It was it was it was a shake, but we, we were thrown off by that. You can only get it in one section. Yeah, it's for elitists. Yeah. <laughs> you, gotta make no. your, you, you gotta make your bums and s'more shake to oh. sell in the, the whiskey. That's yeah, a, that's that's in the works. Our the head bum in charge is a known, you know, uh mixologist. So he's doing a campfire milkshake mixed drink. Uh so keep an eye out for that. Yeah. That's awesome. This is, this is going to oh, be yeah. the prohibited drink. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, tossing yeah. around a lot. Well, we can make an NA version for sure. Definitely. But Baloney, Dougie, once again, thank you guys. We appreciate, really appreciate you, guys. you guys having us on. Thank, thank you, you guys. guys. So this is a lot, ton of fun. This is your home. Thank you. Appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you guys. All right, guys. We are moving on to the White Sox schedule here. Guys. We got Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Phillies on the road. Friday start, Crochet versus Turnbull. Saturday, Soroka versus Wheeler. Sunday, Nostrini likely versus Nola. Trey Turner, he's batting 310, 372 OBP, 423 slug. Went deep tonight. Yep. Guys, we're getting swept in Philly. No shocker there. You guys got anything, Justin, <laughs> while we're on the road? I'm going to go one and three. One out of two. One and two. Sunday? One, one and two. I like the one and two. Uh, I, I think that Eloy being back, being in the lineup, the way Gavin's swinging the bat, maybe they can put the ball in play. Um, I'm going to go one and two. I'm going to go one and two. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm along the lines. Let me get a little bit more specific. I think the only start we win is the, the Nestrini start Sunday. 
Uh, Friday scares me because um, Alec Bohm versus Garrett Crochet hurts. JT Real Muto versus Garrett Crochet hurts. These are good fastball hitters against a pitcher that loves to start the sequence off with the one dog. So I think it's a certain point to where um, Crochet could get ambushed, but then again, it could also be strike one because they could swing right through that fastball that they're expecting to get. So um, one and two, Nestrini is the only one that's going to save us. I got Bryson side in fantasy. Pray for the league. Yeah, I think our best bet would be Friday, but I still have us losing all three. And to go with the second series for next week, we're going to go from Philadelphia to Minnesota on the road versus the Twinkies. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Monday, Cannon versus Paddock. Tuesday, Fetty versus Pablo Lopez. Wednesday, Crochet versus Joe Ryan. Joe Ooh. Ryan is their ace right now. He is absolutely balling right now. Hey. Um, I think we're going to go one, one and two. In I think we could win that series. You're a wild man. But I think Friday, I think they win on Friday with Cannon versus Pat, Paddock. Junior, who are you siding with? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go one and two. Ah. <laughs> ah. Well, Kirilov right now is their best hitter right now. Two eighty eight average, three forty five OBP, five thirty eight slug. I think we can win that series. You know why? Bullpen. Because we got Pedro. They have no closer. <laughs> they have no closer and. Like, you got to think, Gonzo. Joe Ryan is not the ace of the fucking twins. Pablo Lopez is the ace. He's the best pitcher. And I think even the White Sox with that poor-ass offense, I think he could get God. I think Joe's giving him a run for his money. But, yeah, Pablo is. Hold on, wait. Look into the fucking camera and say Joe Ryan is a better pitcher than Pablo Lopez. Look into no, the camera and say I'm that. I'm saying he's giving him a run for his money, though. Okay. But, yes, Pablo, I mean, they traded for him. They gave up their best hitter to do so. And Somebody uh, said that they're going to do a lottery for the uh, – when when does Pedro get canned? Like, do that. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me for odds on that on the on the books. That was so wrong. What if he do – what if they do it on June 10th, June 19th? <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's soon. You know, I wanted to add to that discussion, though, that, like, you know, if Jersey uh, comes up, I really want to see Jerry reach out to Bobby, Bobby Jinx, and hire him. Start him off at, start him off at A, single A. But he's the only player out of that whole group of former players that actually shows a desire to coach. He well, won, there's, he won. There's, Iguchi, there's Iguchi, there's Sergio Santos. Yeah, There's Santos, one. yeah. Bridger too. Which actually well, won at Triple A. But that I think that'd be cool to pair up Sergio Santos and Bobby in single A right now. I don't see a problem with that. I th I think Bobby can manage an affiliated ball. I think I gotta go look. I think Sergio's Sir either in single A or double A, but I, I know, know I know he's, I know I know he's there. Um Yeah. But I mean Bobby Jinx won the independent championship. And then he takes a job at the Windy he City. He still didn't do it. The Windy City Thunderbolts. Um, no, I just ignored. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just ignored <laughs> it. Um, but yeah, Bobby. You know, Bobby's. You know, he's looking for a job. I mean, he's he's at, he's in another independent league right now. I think it's the worthwhile to reach out and. I see think what the great, him and Toby. Him and Toby won that other league that they were in. Him mm -hmm. and Toby Hall, and then he's going to be on the Thunderbolts. I, I think that he's been managing. I don't see why not. He's worn the jersey. He's part of that pride tradition um, that we've been talking about. I don't see why Bobby would not be. Let me, can, I, can I let me bring you guys this right? Is there any chance that Ethan Katz, let's just say Pedro Grafal gets canned, Ethan Katz is the manager? What level of success do you think the White Sox can have with him with being in charge? I don't think that I would go if, – if if Pedro didn't have any experience, Ethan Katz, you cut that experience by half. I don't think he even has more than five years in professional baseball. God, they called him the high school pitcher. 
pitching coach forever. I think he's yeah. finally getting his bearings under him. Um, I think that would be a hard sell to to, to make the jump. Yeah, uh, they have a lot of guys that you know they got they got they got the kid in Triple A. Maybe bring the kid from Triple A and, and have him work with uh, with Charlie. You got Charlie who used to manage Toronto. Um, they have a lot of you know they have a lot of uh, uh, a lot of things to consider. I always say this: no matter who they pick, two things are not going to happen. They're not going to be Ozzy and Tony for that third and fourth place all time winning record, who are still the only two guys alive that are like in that top ten. And they're not going to be in that top uh, two managers to ever bring the most money to the Chicago White Sox. That's that's two lists that are owned by Ozzy and Tony. In their eras, they brought the most money to the Chicago White Sox. Not only that, they brought their own uh, fabric to win in baseball games. Like they figured it out. Like, out. What do I need to do socially to get these guys in position to win? But that's just, no, I'm saying that's a story though for like for Gonzo's point on the on the triple A kid. You know, Tony started his career with the White Sox. Ozzy started his career with the White Sox. So for them to have another guy kind of build that um that rapport for the future, it wouldn't be out of like their because they both Tony and Ozzy are both started in the Chicago White Sox organization for managing, by the way. So real quick, that wraps up our schedule. We're moving on to last but not least. Our picks to click. Last week, I picked the man who just hit his. What? Or I think it was game two. Gavin extended the lead to two nothing with that solo blast. I picked Gavin Sheets. I'm getting the victory for week two. And right now, for picks to click, me and Junior are tied at one. Justin's looking for his first win. Um, tonight, I'm gonna start off by going with. Hi, mom. Eloy is back. My pick is Eloy. Justin, you picked Sosa. That was better than OJ's pick of... I have to go back here and look at it. Andrew on. I picked Andrew. I picked AV. Yeah, you did pick AV. I picked, I picked AV. <laughs> I picked AV, baby. I, lo I low-key... Maybe I will win pick to click if the White Sox get better players. Hey, we can, get pick the players, hey we, can pick, we can pick the clank. Damn. The player that's going to get the most games played and is going to play the worst. Pick All the right, clank. I'm, all right, I'm going with Cuz Corey Lee. Is that your your victory or your clank? Oh, that's my that's my pick. Corey Lee. L E E. Okay. Gotcha. OJ. Don't misspell Lee. Um, hold on. Uh, you got a lot of options, actually. Get Maldonado. Be oh. a man. Yeah, you know, just that's what that's what we're doing now. Get get the Fletcher. <laughs> what does my dad call the shortstop guy? Shoemaker. Uh, shoemaker. Yeah, he keeps butchering that poor guy's name. Wait, can I ch can I change my can I change my pick? You can change it. Who are you yeah, gonna change you it for? All right, give me Paul DeYoung. Yes, sir. Yeah. I thought about him. I thought about getting Paul DeYoung. I'm thinking right now I just got to pick somebody that is getting playing time because I can't go. Well, I was going to ride Andrew Vaughn again. Um, you, you know what? Pick crochet. Crochet might have two starts. No. What about Jordan Leisure? Yeah. He might see I'm, some more in innings. Well, here's the thing, though. I don't think that because I'm trying to see if Andrew Bonds is going to play. No. Because now that's my concern is that he's not going to get enough playing time. Oh, he just, I mean, he, even if he's he, playing, he's facing Turnbull, Wheeler, and Nola. That's two sombreros and a sacrifice. Oh, player. you know what? Give me the Italian stallion, Dominic. I told like you, that. yeah, go ahead, get Dominic Fletcher. Oh, Let's, yeah. get Dom -Dom. Let's get the Dom Dom. Let's Italian get the Dom Dom. Stallion. He was leading off. They won. The Italian like Stallion. It. All right, guys. Our picks to click for week three is going to be 
Me going with Eloy Jimenez. Jay is going with Paul DeYoung, who had a really solid game, solid doubleheader today. And OJ is going with Fletcher, who's an on-base machine, and he's now batting leadoff, folks. OJ, not Simpson. OJ, Ian. Mm-hmm. No, nah, you sense. definitely alive. You <laughs> did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. All right. On that note, <laughs> we're going to oh. shout outs. I'm not sure if OJ just shout out OJ, but. I did not shout out OJ. I did not do that. <laughs> I'm going to be honest, though. I did tweet about him because everybody was like sharing. No, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, it was really ironic because no one wanted to talk about it. But I feel Buff Brown OJ. That's my new nickname. No, I'm going to be, so you know, like when you think about things when you were a kid and then you're an adult and you look back and say, why, you, well, this is awkward. Like, why was this happening? So when I was in middle school, the, so first of all, when OJ and the Bronco chase happened, I was in the clubhouse with my brother in the White Sox ballpark pregame. Like they're all like, oh, OJ. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, who's this OJ dude? And when I saw his picture, I'm like, oh, the guy from the movies. Because at the time, at my age, I did not know that he had played football. Um. <laughs> Mind you, within the next week, everybody was everybody like knew like everything about OJ. But then when the trial happened, and again, I'm like I'm like nine or ten years old. I'm like young. I remember being in middle school and being like in PE class, and I don't know why in my school they read the verdict through the the PA announcement. Like they and the kids were like jumping up and down, like celebrating, like he's not guilty. Like it was just I was I'm like. <laughs> It was so wrong. And it was one of those things that I'm like, like, I'm a parent now, and I'm like, why are they playing a verdict of a murder trial in the school system? And it was just so off. It was like one of those off things. But I did get to meet him, and we wanted pictures in middle school. His son played uh, at Gulliver Prep, and they played our prep school. Um, and I, I saw his daughter at a couple parties. Like We were like rival school. But his son was actually a pretty good football player in high school, like JV and stuff. But it must have been awkward because, like, I've been, like, I've had a celebrity dad, but I was, like, nothing like this. Like, everybody was just staring at OJ. And he would watch the game, like, in a corner. And we went, we were high schoolers, and we went up to him, and we asked for an autograph. And he must have known, like, we, we got his autograph, and he didn't take a picture. But we were, like, walking away, like, giggling. And, again, it's one of those things that you look back, and you're like, this guy is probably, like, these kids are probably giggling about, you know, my life. And it was just one of those weird things. Like, again, this guy that it's been part of these awkward moments of my life. I don't know why, but again, all these like jokes about the OJ. So we've been joking about that. Like I'm OJ. Cause everybody calls me that multiple people. And I'm like, not Simpson. Cause now it's famous again. OJ is like, okay, this is kind of fucked up. <laughs> that is just really fucked up. Your dad killed it on the whole field. Only. I had to take that comment down before we get fucking flagged. <laughs> Doug trying to get us canceled. Oh, so, 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 uh, uh, shout out to you guys. Great show. Shout out to the bum guys who I actually listen to a lot and I'm a big fan of them. They're doing awesome things. Those tailgates are awesome. Um, and I think extremely important in this moment, what the White Sox are going through for people with that fandom to be around and stick around with the team. And when a team gets back on top and gets back to its glory days, those are the people that you really celebrate because, um, again, they're like, they're like, they're going through it. Uh, with the team they're there they're supporting they're not they're not doing the whole like let's boycott the team don't watch the games um because i'm not a fan of that because there's people that make money in the stadium from people going to games you shouldn't deprive yourself of having a good time and enjoying baseball live because again again everyone can spend their money how they want so shout out to those guys because they're they're really fun and, and they're having a really good time and um shout out to real madrid for all you non-soccer fam fans wow. that are we were underdogs. We whooped them the best team in the world on the best player in the world. Uh, and we're going to another finals in uh, in the Champions League. So we are the standard of success and greatness in the world of sports. What type of shit is that, man? Like, you waited. And, and you know what? Baloney, I hope you like that. We're going to cut this for you, and we're going to send it gift wrap for you, Baloney. Because, you know, he's a real Madrid fan, too. Yeah, we were going to probably watch games together. My whole family was watching today. It was a standard of every time we were always the top dog. Today we went into the matches, the underdog. No one believed in us. 
plus 400 to win, plus 250 and a half, made money on both of them. It's just great. It's I, I hope that the team, that the White Sox will ever get to experience something like this, like they were in 05, like you're on top of the world. Imagine doing that year after year. And for the team in Venezuela that I'm associated to, that's what I would like to build. The standard of greatness of like where you want to be in there, where you look up and you have that many championships and no one can say anything to you. That's what you want from a franchise. That you're in it every year. Go ahead, Justin. Uh, well, do you guys know the drill? Got to give a shout out to Asia. Uh, pack full of orders next week. Uh, it's going to be amazing for me to sit by while she work her ass off and I do nothing but manage my fantasy lineups. Um, the Chicago White Sox have put me in a position, Gonzo, to not only um, hate the team, but I hate myself for continuing to consume the team. But I like being a consumer. And tonight you brought on the Bumcast. So now I get to consume whiskeys at Comiskey's, tailgates on Saturdays, clown Jerry shirts. Like this is one of the few benefits of being a White Sox fan. And it's one of the things that I agree with Ozzy Gann Jr. We have an opportunity to be content creators while still being consumers. I don't have to avoid being a fan of none of these guys. I could still consume the 108. I'm still gonna consume uh, Sox on Tap, the bum cast, because that is what the White Sox Twitter is providing me. That's the nutritional value, and I'm not gonna take that for granted. So I want to give a shout out to the Bumcast, the 108, Fat Guy Radio, Ray's Juke Joint, all of the fucking platforms that have came on the blackout because me, Jay Targaryen, a.k.a. Justin Lee, I get to consume all of you guys at the same time and have my cake and eat it too. Gonzo, before you go, that was awesome. I'm really excited uh, that we got Reese and that we got Cardoso on the WNBA Sky Team. I never have gone to a game. I will definitely go there now um, and watch them because I'm a big fan of those uh, both young ladies. Um, like them at the post. Like how they play. Yeah, so we got two superstars in, in the sport. So they might be the next champion, I think, in Chicago again. They're the closest thing from winning. Low key. Low key, by the way. Um and yeah, so that I, I I know that I miss some. Oh, I was gonna tell you guys real on the shout outs. What happened? What would you guys do if they don't draft Caleb? Like if they do something from like draft day and they draft someone completely different, but like like that ruin like your whole month. You I'm not prepared for me. a world like that. What? You probably won't see me. I'll have to cancel the next month of shows. <laughs> okay, I'm just wondering. I was just like, because everybody's like on him, and I'm like, ah oh, man, I wonder if like it's like the like the movie draft day, and like it's like it was always somebody else, like an offensive lineman. Yeah, no, I'm not, not, even, I'm not I'm, even gonna I'm, worry even about it. To that. Like, uh, I yeah. It was just a random question, a random fan I question can't. about because I know you guys are like huge fans, like, you guys really believe on this guy. So, all right, just because you said like, that, I'm muting you, I'm getting back to I my flip, shout out. I will flip the fucking city, OJ. All right, if we don't draft Caleb, literally, <laughs> there's a reason why he has no top 30s on any other team, it's just the Bears. He's coming to Chicago, folks. Don't worry. There's a reason why his dad told oh. Keenan, Keenan Allen that he can keep th 13 because he's not going to be wearing 13. He's going to be wearing 18, by the way. Because if you go oh, on the really? Chicago Bears, yeah, if you go on the Chicago Bears website and you do oh, a customize, if you do a customization jersey for Caleb Williams, you can pick any number you want Except besides 18. 18. Did not know that. So. That's already in the works. It's already it's it's done. Are you leaking? Are you leaking? Are you wait, wait, leaking? No, you can go do it right I'm now. And I'm dropping Kyle Hendricks this week for my fantasy team. Just everybody should know that. Why is he on your fucking team? Because <laughs> I believed in him. The no only more. the only Cubs that deserve to be drafted <laughs> is Steel, Morel, and Hap. Now, those are the only three four Cubs starts. That I, 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 I thought about it today. Four starts. I looked at the scores today. He's just, it's not, it's not happening. The moves need to be made. I'm not waiting around and being three and 15. I'm making early. He throws moves. better BP I'm than agile. Bryce Harper's dad. <laughs> I'm being agile. I'm being agile. I'm not sitting on my laurels. I'm not going to be you know waiting three and 15. I'm making Come on. 
Hey, OJ, Trey, I need you. Trey I need you. Trini. What's up? <laughs> I need you to be. I need you to be agile because you had a rough last week. So I need you to get bounced back. That's what I need. I need to bounce back. And this week didn't start too good either. So, <laughs> no. Alvarez. Shit, I got cream pie by KG. By the way, these Venezuelans are going cold. I need to change it up. <laughs> <laughs> Is there such thing as cold Venezuelans? No, they, they are for me this week. Last people. Week. Last week we hit like one zero <laughs> zero. We felt like we were on the White Sox. So this week they're not producing. <laughs> I'll have to make all these moves. Y'all felt like y'all was Cubans. Yeah, we're about to all get released for a bunch of boys from Alabama. Right, my shout-outs are the one and only Soraya holding the dogs down the other room. We actually had an incident over the weekend with the dogs. We're not going to talk about it, but just know that we're all good in the hood. Dogs are doing great. Everything's excellent in my life right now. I'm also going to shout-out the bums for coming on with us, for giving us just about two hours of their time. That was a hell of a conversation. Um, hopefully, I can make it to the whiskey in the park. I got to be there. Lot B, Justin, you better not go there without me. Um, I'm also going to shout out some people in the chats. Some of my favorite comments of the tonight, starting off with KG, as always. <laughs> Justin just said, Ukraine. That's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> I also got a shout out. SBB in the chat driving us nuts because um, we had to cancel Grafal tonight. But thank you for giving us your opinion. And last but not least, Mrs. Baloney, who was on fire in the chat. Baloney wasn't lying. She she came out represented. Thanks, Julie, for watching. Appreciate you. Gracias. And guys, that is it for shout outs. You're not gonna shout out Nastrini and and uh and Cannon? I thought you were gonna give him like flowers, like you're gonna say at the end. He needs no? to see more. Don't I need to you. see more. I need to see more. Nostrini. I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, yeah. No, I need to see more because there, no there are no Tyler McKenzie's. But there are no Tyler McKenzie's. Tristan McKenzie's. Well, no, because they're actually on the field. And they're better. <laughs> The one thing that God wants so bad from this team is such a good <laughs> just to give me <laughs> He's like, we'll lose every game as long as we have a good staff. <laughs> That's all I care about. <laughs> you must, you'll, go 40, you'll go 40. You'll win 40 games as long as that pitching staff is in the top five. <laughs> that and our boy Cease is killing it. That's all I care about right now. So, guys. Wow. Bumcast was here. Got to have them on again. Um, you guys didn't catch it. There's two hours of the show. We appreciate you all tuning in and watching the Blackout Show. Um, guys, you have any other shout-outs or anything? Any other residual comments you have left here? I'm Prairie Dog. OJ? Good night. See you guys soon. Good night. Thank you for watching the Blackout.